Thank you for standing by. In a moment, I will be handed over to the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Communications, Amy Schiffer. As a reminder, all participants have their video and audio disabled by default. If you have any questions, please submit them to the Q&A. Jeannie, the floor is yours when you're ready. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the FAA's Alaska Aviation Safety Summit on Zoom and on the FAA's Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook live streams. Before we start the meeting, I'd like to provide everyone with a few housekeeping notes. First off, we are not here to solicit consensus advice or recommendations for anyone or to assign any tasks to the group, but we are really interested in taking your questions. To do that, we will be soliciting comments and questions using the chat feature for our participants in the Zoom meeting. Feel free to submit a question at any time. After some introductory remarks from our FAA Deputy Administrator, Dan Elwell, Senator Dan Sullivan, and Congressman Don Young, we will have several panels, the first moderated by FAA Administrator Steve Dixon. During and after Steve's panel, we will select some questions that you've submitted and ask him to discuss these with his panel. For the remaining three panels, please continue to submit your questions, but we will hold all of them until all panels are complete. Our FAA team is monitoring the live stream, and if you have any problems at any time, just give them a shout and they will assist you immediately. And for any reporters who are joining us on the live stream, Please note that all discussions are for background purposes only. No quotes or attributions should be taken without permission from the panel participants. And we are in a live virtual environment, so interruptions are not unheard of. So if you hear a vacuum cleaner or a dog or if a child runs in the room, we will just take it in stride and keep moving on. So let's get started. We're very fortunate to have FAA Deputy Administrator Dan Elwell to launch today's safety summit. Dan has a long history traveling to Alaska and working for aviation safety issues in Alaska, starting with his time as a legislative fellow for the late Senator Ted Stevens, and later, of course, as a deputy administrator for the FAA. After his remarks, Dan will introduce our spe special guests from the Hill before we get started on our panels. So Dan, please take it away. Had a little trouble getting the video on. Thanks, Jeannie, for that uh, introduction. And I welcome everyone joining us today for the Alaska Aviation Safety Summit. We've got an all-star cast today from Alaska Senator Dan Sullivan and, and Alaska Congressman Don Young to FAA Administrator Steve Dixon. And four panels chock full of federal, state, and industry experts on aviation and what it means to Alaska. Now let me set the stage with my impressions of Alaska and its unique promise and challenges. Before I do, I wanna give a shout out to Terry Krause, our FAA historian, who just published a new book on the rich history of aviation in Alaska, some of which you'll hear about today. And you can find a link to her book on uh, FAA.gov. Well, like Denali, aviation has become synonymous with Alaska. It's been that way for a hundred years. Ever since the Army's Black Wolf Squadron of four Curtis JN-4B Jenny biplanes flew there from New York in July of 1920 to prove that you could move people and possessions in days by air as opposed to months on the ground. And it didn't take long for these winged icons to become part of Alaska folklore. Carl Ben Eilson, Alaska's first commercial airmail pilot and a Fairbanks high school teacher 
became legendary with the press and the locals for his daring flights in the mid 1920s. And so impressive was the sight of the man bird in the skies that the Yukon Indians who knew him as the moose ptarmigan intended to make him a chief. In Ben's case, being called the equivalent of a large grouse was a badge of honor. And with the exploits of Eilson and others, also came the realization that flying in this new frontier had its own unique safety challenges. For Eilson, the US Postal Service grounded him and withdrew one of the first contracts to fly airmail after only three months on the job. Now there were clear concerns. The man bird had damaged his plane three times in eight flights and he ran out of spare parts. Well, We've come a long way in aviation since then, but what hasn't changed is the need for a continuous focus on safety. For me personally, my first look at our most majestic state was from the air. I was a young Air Force pilot in the 80s, flying a Lockheed 141B Starlifter from Norton Air Force Base, California, where I was stationed, to Elmendorf Air Force Base in, in Anchorage, and did that many, many times. But I was immediately struck by the sight of harsh terrain. And looking down, at, I couldn't imagine making an emergency landing on the rocks and ice. Of course, we know that's what Alaska pilots do every day. If huge tundra wheels won't work, then we put skis on or floats. And much of what I know about Alaska aviation, I learned through my 10-year association with Senator Ted Stevens, starting as a fellow in his office. Uncle Ted, as many who had the pleasure of working him, working for him called him, of course, not to his face. He was a World War II pilot. He flew the hump. He loved aviation. He continued flying into his 80s. He had his private pilot license, and much to the chagrin of his wife, Catherine, he also got his float license, a must-have skill for most Alaskan pilots. Senator Stevens knew how to talk to pilots and more importantly, understood the uniqueness and challenges of flying in Alaska. Something I know today's Alaskan congressional delegation know very well and they carry on to this day. Before I was introduced to Alaskan aviation, I heard from some regulators in the lower 48 that Alaskan pilots were cowboys. And as I flew around the state and spent more time among the pilot community, I learned that nothing could be further from the truth. Now, while every population has its outliers, I found that the vast majority of aviators in Alaska are like pilots everywhere. Safety is their number one priority. And in a state where the weather is harsh and the terrain unforgiving, pilots keep their eyes and their radios open to help each other out. Clark Pass is clear, is music to a pilot's ears as long as the report comes from another pilot and it's not more than a few minutes old. That's why the FAA worked with Congress to make sure weather cameras were installed in some of Alaska's remote airports and treacherous passes, <laughs> like, like Jeannie called it. Uh, that's why cameras were installed in, in these passes in, like Clark and Rainey and Moose and Merrill. Aviation safety in Alaska has improved significantly since the late 90s, in part due to technologies like ADSB, weather cameras, and efforts of leaders like Senator Stevens, Senator Sullivan, and Congressman Young, and the creation of the Medallion Foundation in 2002. These efforts and others were instrumental in cutting Alaska's general aviation fatal accident rate almost in half since the 1990s. But as Administrator Dixon says, safety is a journey, not a destination. And we're always in search of ways to improve. And I can't think of a better group of safety advocates and professionals than those of you here today to help us continue on that journey. And with that, I'd like to kick off today's event by introducing one of our keynote speakers, Senator Dan Sullivan. And Senator Sullivan was sworn in five years ago and today serves on four Senate committees vital to Alaska. Commerce, Science and Transportation Committee, the Armed Services Committee, the Environment and Public Works Committee, and the Veterans Affairs Committee. 
And before becoming a senator, he served as Alaska's attorney general and commissioner of the Alaska Department of Natural Resources. Earlier in his public service career, Senator Sullivan served in several senior roles under President George W. Bush. He is a colonel in the U.S. Marine Corps Reserve, having previously been on active duty since 93. As a reservist, he's been called back to active duty twice since that time, most recently in 2013 to serve with a joint task force in Afghanistan, focusing on dismantling terrorist networks. We thank you for your service, Senator. He's also fairly well-educated, particularly for a Marine, <laughs> says, says the Air Force guy from uh, safely from four time zones away. Um, but the Senator earned a BA in economics from Harvard University in 87 and a joint law and masters of science and foreign service from Georgetown University in 1993. Senator Sullivan is one of the most active members of Congress on aviation issues and routinely works with the FAA, advocating for innovation and safety initiatives in Alaska. We've talked a number of times, Senator, over many issues, and I'm very, very proud to work with you and for you and to serve uh, your service. I thank you for your service to Alaska. Please welcome Senator Dan Sullivan. Well, thank you, Dan, and I appreciate you. Um, I appreciate that kind introduction, and thank you for your service as well. I won't. I won't do any Marine Corps Air Force uh, jabs back and forth, but uh, you guys do always have the the bases with the nice golf courses, so we we, we appreciate that very much. Um, but thank you for your service uh, and what you're doing now, and. Um, I want to I want to thank a number of folks. First, uh, our aviation community that's on the line. It looks like a great turnout. This summit is something we've been working on for quite a while, and uh, it's going to be a great agenda. But I want to thank all of you, particularly during these challenging times, keeping our state moving, our economy moving, our supplies, our mail moving. Uh, your role is so important. And it's not always appreciated and it's difficult, particularly now. And I just really want to thank you. You know, there's a lot of celebration during this pandemic of the um, teleworking and telecommuting and everything. But the people who are actually keeping our economy moving, uh, particularly during these challenging times, they can't telework. Uh, they can't telecommute. You got to get in a plane and fly. So I want to thank everybody and um, I appreciate the great attendance. Uh, on this event. I also wanna, I also wanna thank the administrator and the entire FAA staff. This was a, an issue, this summit idea was something that I talked about with the uh, FAA administrator and his team uh, to, to let them hear directly from Alaskans on so many important issues. And I believe this is the first time the administrator and and the FAA has held a summit that relates to uh, aviation in just one state. And so uh, our state, our great state. So we wanna thank you for that. And of course, we all wanted this to happen in person, but with the pandemic, um, uh, I'm still just thankful the opportunity. And the, again, the great turnout uh, from so many experts, uh, the ability to do this virtually, it's second best, but, um, uh, we're still doing it, and I think that's important. And Dan, I want to thank you for highlighting what my office and I do on a regular basis. Uh, many of you know Scott, who's on the line right now, and my staff working closely with Senator Murkowski and Congressman Young's team. Uh, we're very, very, very focused on the aviation issues. And, and Dan, you mentioned some of the reasons why our state clearly is more dependent on passenger air cargo transport than any other place in the country with over 80 percent of our communities uh, accessible uh, not by roads but by air or by river so it's critical and our communities pilots air carriers passengers ga community all deserve safe reliable well-funded aviation systems and infrastructure this is probably my number one issue, the administrator hears it from me on a very regular basis that, hey, just because we're big and we're remote 
doesn't mean we should not get what everybody else gets, particularly as it relates to safety. We know it might be expensive, but we're Americans like everybody else. And that's uh, something that I think is really important. And for the Alaskans participating today, I know you're gonna reinforce that message. And also that certainly for our state, across so many different areas, a one size fits all approach to regulations from federal agencies doesn't work. So I think the FAA knows that. We have a great FAA team here in Alaska. I love to go visit them. They do such a great job. Our air traffic controllers, they do an amazing job. So I wanna thank all of them as well for the great work that they're all doing. Let me talk a little bit first about what's happening with the pandemic and the big challenges that we've had as a nation because of COVID-19. This has obviously impacted the entire country, but our state in particular has been really hit hard. Um, of course, the health challenges remain. Uh, we're seeing an uptick in COVID cases, but the challenges to our economy, tourism, the energy sector, the commercial fishing sector, and of course, the aviation community has uh, really, really been significant. Uh, we have worked hard with all of you and the FAA, by the way, through action that the Congress has taken, particularly the CARES Act, that's provided opportunities for support for many of our carriers through PPP loans and through aviation grants, through the Treasury payroll support grants for many of our carriers. Uh, this was something that I was actively involved in negotiating in the CARES Act for big and small carriers, but also after the CARES Act was passed, worked very, very closely um, with the Secretary of the Treasury, who all, who know, I can tell you, knows a lot about Alaska aviation um, because it was so important and our advocacy was very, very consistent um, with regard to CARES Act funding, but also help and relief efforts from the federal government. We're not out of the woods by any sense, uh, given bankruptcies and other reorganizations that are happening. Our aviation sector is certainly in a time of flux. But I again wanna emphasize the appreciation that I have for our aviation community, the pilots, the employees, the companies. I try to get out and see many of you to make sure that we've been able to continue to supply our vast large state with mail, vital goods, services, particularly to our rural communities. Um, you know, the uh, administrator, Administrator Dixon, who's got a great background, very impressive. Some of you might remember uh, last year, only two weeks after his confirmation, uh, I had asked him to participate in the 2019 Alaska Air Carriers Association Part 135 Summit. Uh, he did that, and I appreciate that, Administrator. And I know that the opportunity to discuss many of the topics back then is going to continue today. And so again, I want to thank you for taking time, not just last year, but right now, because this is a really important issue for our state, for our country. I know you're very busy, you and your team, and I just want to thank you for being part of this today. A couple of those topics that I know we'll discuss in depth today that we talked about and the administrator and I have talked about quite a lot in the ensuing year is infrastructure. As I mentioned at the top, this is something that I believe, even if it's expensive, that Alaska should have the infrastructure that other places have because that's just the right thing to do. And um, whether that is reporting, weather reporting and forecasts, air to ground comms to support an expanding aviation uh, industry for better and safer access. These are issues that I know are gonna to be topics today. In the 2018 FAA Reauthorization Act, my team worked hard with the aviation community to address some of our longstanding challenges as it relates to infrastructure investment that has been lacking in the state. For example, we were able to secure in that reauthorization a number of priorities. Let me just touch on a few. To provide long-term stable funding for airport infrastructure through the AIP program, Airport Improvement Program, 
provide stable funding for essential air service. Of course, uh, we've also been very uh, protective of bypass mail, uh, which we defend and is still being funded uh, well right now. Uh, to better utilize instrument approaches, that was also in the FAA REOF, and to acquire new weather reporting and navigation infrastructure. Again, these were in the bills uh, that was passed in 2018, and I want to thank the FAA for making progress on a number of these priorities. As of May of this year, uh, they announced almost $10 million in grants to construct um, new AWOS weather infrastructure in eight locations in our state. Uh, that's good progress. Now, again, I don't want to sound ungrateful, but a lot more needs to be done. I think 35, in fact, pursuant to the FAA REOF, but it is welcome to see the FAA starting to move forward on this kind of progress. It is also my understanding the FAA is finally close to implementation of the requirement for increased utilization of instrument operations for our part 135 carriers. As all of you know, increased use of IFR approaches by 135 operators will allow them to fly to higher altitudes so they don't have to hug mountains using uh, VFR rules. And finally, I just wanna talk about, and these are all related, of course, safety. And Dan, I'm glad you highlighted that. Of course, these uh, priorities have been specifically uh, highlighted by all of us, the FAA and the NTSB, who published a report in February that called for the aviation, or for, I'm sorry, for the FAA to work with other agencies like the state of Alaska and the NTSB to take a more comprehensive approach to improving aviation safety in Alaska. To me, this is a very important report. And what I've mentioned to the administrator and his team is we cannot let this report sit on the shelf and collect dust. We need to move forward on the implementation and ideas that were in that report. So the report points to a recent 10 year period. Now, Dan mentioned that we have had a dramatic increase in safety overall, and we all appreciate that. But this NTSB reports to a recent 10 year period where the total accident rate in Alaska was 2.35 times higher than the rest of the country. And during the same period, the fatal accident rate in Alaska was 1.34 times higher. Again, these numbers have come down over the last several decades, thanks to the FAA, NTSB, the great work as already mentioned of Ted Stevens and Don Young, but I'm sure you'll agree as the NTSB did that we need to do more. Uh, the administrator and I have discussed this report and uh, certainly one of my points of emphasis is that the FAA, in my view, needs to have a focal point on safety for the state of Alaska. And uh, the administrator I know is gonna talk about this, but has committed to provide a holistic view to solve the problems presented in our state. And I think an important aspect of this summit in this NTSB report, will be able to make sure that um, the FAA leadership on the line today hears from Alaskans on the front lines on how we do this holistic uh, uh, approach. So I just wanna end by saying, you know, we've had an amazing partnership with the FAA, with Alaska Aviators, this is so important to get your ideas. You're on the front line. So many of you have been drivers of innovation and safety improvements that in many ways have been a model, not just for Alaska, but for the entire country. And the preservation and expansion of safety aviation infrastructure and assets in Alaska are of paramount importance. It's what I talk to the FAA Administrator Dixon about all the time. Sometimes they may even get tired of me doing that, but that's my job representing all of you. And I do think that this summit is a great opportunity for Alaska's aviation leaders to weigh in directly with the administrator and his team for your ideas. But I do wanna thank the administrator and all the FAA for being part of this today. This is a really good opportunity, great turnout, great agenda. We're making do even during the COVID times 
And now it's my honor and pleasure to turn over the podium, virtual podium, to Congressman Don Young, the Dean of the House, who also knows a heck of a lot about aviation. So thanks again, everybody. Congressman Young, I'm honored to be on this panel or this uh, event with you. Thank you, Dan. And I think if you can hear me, Dan. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I'm gonna say, and for the listening audience, you and I shop at the same store, Colf, uh, we bought both shirts. If you look at me and you, uh, I'm glad you show good taste. I just wanna appreciate that. <laughs> I hope you understand what I'm saying. If you look at our, both of our shirts, they're exactly the same. Anyway, again, it's taking the other Dan for this program and, and bringing us together. And, you know, I listened to my senator, Senator Dan Sullivan, how he presented the facts to you and what we're doing as a team. And he is the leader in this. He's very actively involved. I've been involved with the being chairman of transportation and one that flies a great deal. So I'm quite interested in what the FAA does and what the operators in Alaska do and where we can be of help. I think that's the most important factor that we're facing today because we have come a long ways. We have, I think, a better relationship with the FAA now than we did in the past. I hope you feel the same way. If you don't, let me know and why not. Uh, I, I would suggest to the FAA there's some things we can prove. And Dan covered most everything I had in my little presentation, so I'm not going to duplicate it. But I, I would suggest respectfully that I'd like to start the Medallion Association up again or foundation. Uh, so that we could um, uh, have a real training program because you check all the accidents. I'd say 99.9% .9 of the accidents is not the airplane, it's in fact the pilot and they don't understand some things when flying in Alaska. Overall, I think we've got a good safety record considering our size of our state and the distance we have to go in the form of airfields which we have. So I'm sort of pleased with the operators for that factor. Second one, we have to recognize that we need to put in weather stations. I noticed Dan, uh, Senator Sullivan mentioned this, uh, when FAA pass came out with the idea we're gonna operate it all out of Anchorage, nonsense. That's a big stage like having weather in the United States. I want on ground facilities, observe what's occurring. So we don't have that challenge to a pilot that's flown 400 miles to get into an airport. Now the weather changed in between from what was told him on the airport he, he departed from. So that's what some of the areas I'm interested in. The second thing I'd like, like to suggest that we have for the FAA is I want you to be more aggressive uh, to the pilots and every, everyone else on, I don't want other agencies within the state setting different standards than the FAA does for the employment of an air operator. Uh, I, I hope you don't understand what I mean. I know certain agencies uh, go above and beyond the FAA requirements. I don't think that's important when it does it precludes a lot of local operators from participating in other agencies' transportation programs. So take a good look at that one too. Overall, I think we're done well. I fly a lot. Uh, you know, all my life I've been in small planes and I used to have a Navajo. I didn't have it. Paul Aglin had it. Tremendous program of going to all the villages and visiting people, both remote and urban, uh, getting there on time. And uh, what her happened, we got thought we were getting smart and they precluded that. So I apologize for not flying with an awful lot of you pilots and, and our operators in the state of Alaska. This is a challenging time. I'm not gonna go in the pandemic because it's always a, a divided issue, uh, but I think we have to get the economy going again in the state and in this nation or we're not gonna survive. <clears throat> We've seen what it's done in the tourist industry, what it's done to the aviation industry. I wanna make sure too, as the, some of them like uh, Raven went down, I wanna make sure that those are replaced Raven have the highest standards possible, and that's up to the FAA. Now, saying all that, I have uh, the privilege of many, many, many years ago of uh, having a fine aircraft, and I misused it, and I actually had a terrible accident. And I'm going to offer all of you listening to this show, take out a piece of paper, and if you can tell me the words that 99.9% .9 of pilots use just before the hit, write it down send it into my office, I'll buy you dinner with the congressman. My number, my address is 471 West 36th Avenue, Suite 210, Anchorage, Alaska, 99503. So if you can remember all, if you can fill the words and they're correct, I'll check it out and uh, I'll take you out to, to dinner, your choice. And uh, I'm not going to take out an issue. All of you get the right words. No collusion now. You've got to do it on your own and date it on a program and we'll see what happens. God bless the aviation industry. This is a tremendous state. I don't know, my staff just handed me something 
And uh, I said, oh, I, I, I did fly yesterday, by the way, with seaplanes down here in Juneau over to Sitka and uh, Pilatus. Great pilot, beautiful trip, but quicker than the big airlines. So I am a big promoter of that type of operation. Came back on the same airlines or uh, charter operation, and it was good. So with that, I'd like to open it up. I don't know, Dan, whether we're going to have questions or what we're going to discuss, but I'm available, the Senator's available, and we're going to continue to do it. See, Dan Sullivan, just remember this now. Tell me, did you get a discount or did I did get a discount? I'm through, guys. God bless you. <laughs> well, I, I think we're moving on to our next panel, if that's, not, if that's correct. Yes, sir. That, yes, sir. That's correct. And, and thank you very much, Congressman Young. And thank you, Senator Sullivan. Thank you very much for, for being here with us um, and taking the time uh, to be part of this today. We really appreciate your participation and, of course, your continued support for aviation safety initiatives for Alaska and for the entire nation. So thank you very much. You're quite um, welcome. Did you, did, did you notice we were right on time now? Give me credit for that. You, you were right on time. Absolutely. On the, on the dot. Thank you, sir. Thank um, you. I, yes, I sir. Feel your shirt, I have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, guys. Yes, thank you. Uh, and you're, you're correct, Senator. Next, we're going to have uh, FAA Administrator uh, Steve Dixon moderate our first panel, um, where we will discuss the state of the state of aviation in Alaska. Uh, on the panel, we have Clark Dessing, an expert on Alaska operations with the FAA's air traffic, organiza air traffic organization. John Bender, who is the deputy commissioner for the Alaska Department of Transportation. And Lee Ryan, chairman of Alaska's Aviation Advisory Board. So welcome to you all and thank you for participating. And as we get started, uh, Administrator Dixon will set the stage for the discussions with the panel members for the next 30 minutes. And when the panel is complete, I'll relay the questions you've submitted uh, to the administrator for further discussion. So Administrator Dixon, please take it away. Thanks, Jeannie. And uh, welcome everybody to this uh, meeting. It's great to see the, all the participation uh, that we've got today. And I wanna thank everybody for their, uh, for their leadership and commitment to uh, aviation safety and uh, the aviation industry uh, in the state of Alaska. And uh, also appreciate uh, Senator Sullivan's uh, perspective and also Congressman Young. I'll note that uh, Dan and I are also wearing the same shirt, a little different color, but the same shirt with the FA logo on it. So, uh, so I guess we're matching you guys uh, today. Uh, so there he is. All right. So, um, um, you know, I appreciate uh, those perspectives. As, as Senator Sullivan said, we have had uh, regular discussions about the importance of aviation uh, to the state of Alaska. Uh, we get it. Um, you know, uh, we know that the Alaska congressional delegation is constantly taking the pulse uh, of the aviation industry and experiences life a little differently than those of us outside of Alaska, not to mention those of us inside the Capitol Beltway in Washington, DC. And I will be the first one to say uh, that not all wisdom emanates from 800 Independence Avenue uh, in Washington. And I think that you can multiply that by a factor of 10. It's really important when it comes to the state of Alaska, it's really important for us uh, to have uh, your perspectives. And uh, it's one reason why uh, Alaska is the only uh, state in the union that has its own FA regional office. And we're, we're going to leverage that. That's something uh, of, of great value to us. And it's a venue that really helps us uh, bring all the, the uh, resources and the perspective of the agency uh, together. You know, thanks to uh, uh, Senator Sullivan's invitation uh, very early in my tenure, I had planned uh, in August to take a deep dive uh, into aviation, the flying community, uh, and America's last frontier. Um, but like many things, that was before uh, we had to deal with COVID-19. So, you know, I look forward to that in-person visit and becoming more thoroughly immersed um, in the uh, Alaska aviation uh, culture and, um, and, and uh, all the stakeholder perspectives. On the other hand, 
you know, this technology actually affords us an opportunity in a way, even though it's, it's not as satisfying in some respects as being together in person, it actually probably allows us at one time to bring uh, a lot of stakeholders together that would be very difficult to get together uh, in a room at the same time. Um, you know, that trip, in, that trip that we planned in August was in part to celebrate 100 years of flight service, which is uh, a weather and aeronautical information service that has become particularly important in the complex environment and airspace of the state of Alaska. And that's a perfect segue uh, to the issue of safety uh, that will be a continuing theme I know today. You know, I'm a bit jealous of Dan who got to launch the summit by talking about his personal adventures in Alaska. And if you talk to him in private and bring a, a beverage with you, he'll regale you with quite a few more stories. My experiences are a little bit different. Um, I was an F-15 pilot in the Air Force. I was never stationed at Elmendorf. Had a couple of uh, short deployments. Uh, and then later as a pilot for Delta over a number of years, I flew the Seattle uh, Anchorage route a few times in the 727 and later uh, in the 757. And later, of course, uh, flying the uh, Asia routes uh, for Delta, I flew out of uh, Seattle and Portland and spent many an hour talking to uh, Anchorage Center on the way to Asia. But I have not been out you know, in the state uh, other than that. And so I know that there are some gaps in my education that, uh, that I need to fill. But uh, you know, though our experiences were different, both Dan and I were struck by the fact that Alaska is no ordinary place to fly. Um, it's different from the rest of the country. Its aviation infrastructure and its aviators uh, have to reflect that because of the, the criticality and the importance of aviation uh, to the state's economy and really to the ability of communities to be uh, connected. Alaska, as we all know, has the lowest population density of any of the 50 states with 82% of the communities accessible only by air. And I think uh, Senator Sullivan talked about that earlier. That brings home the importance of aviation considering Alaska covers nearly 600,000 square miles, more than twice as big as Texas. Of course, the second largest state in the US. Although I don't know you can tell a Texan that, but that's uh, true. Add to that the mountainous terrain and the high latitude weather, and you've got the potential for inherently dangerous air transportation. And let's not forget the national security aspects of increasing global access and interest in the Arctic as land ice and sea ice uh, begin to recede. Alaska is also on the leading edge of what we might expect elsewhere in terms of infrastructure and operation. For example, the melting of the permafrost is having a significant impact on runway maintenance and uh, runway condition. Getting started with research and development on issues like this could help us in other locations. Now, this wouldn't be new to Alaska, it wouldn't be unusual. Alaska is informally known as the national test bed for a lot of research and development. Just think about ADSB and the capstone program. RFA region says it best. If it looks hard, we try it up here in Alaska first. So we're here today to talk about how the FAA and the industry can best support the safety, security, and capacity of, the, of this amazing frontier, as well as to discuss the technicalities of Alaskan aviation in terms of communication, navigation, surveillance, and infrastructure. Most importantly, we've got to keep in mind what's emblazoned on the Alaska state flag, Polaris, the North Star. At the FAA, we like to say that safety is our North Star, and it has to be yours as well. It's true that the types of accents we see in Alaska mirror what we see elsewhere, the weather, terrain, and the pressing need for this crucial mode of transportation. All of these amplify the threats. And as has been said a couple of times already, while the total accident rate in Alaska for general aviation and non-scheduled air carriers is higher than the rest of the United States. The fatal accident rate for this segment is only slightly higher, and the trend has been in the right direction. But as Dan noted, you know, we've got to get up every day and realize that, safe, that safety is a journey, and we always have to, to, uh, to improve. What we're 
what we've done in the past, we can never be satisfied with. And what we are doing now is not going to be good enough in the future. We've got to continue to find ways to collaborate uh, and improve. We, we can never relax. Um, you know, even though I think the trends are positive, uh, recent fatal accidents remind us how fragile any safety record uh, can be. Over the past year, um, as the Senator said, we've had a number of conversations about what more can be done to bring about a new level of safety in Alaska. And those conversations happen to be similar to the safety recommendations made by the NTSB back in February. Specifically, the, FAA, the NTSB asked that the FAA work with stakeholders who service the Alaska aviation industry to implement a safety focused working group to review, prioritize, and integrate Alaska's aviation safety needs into the FAA's safety enhancement process. The board formed that recommendation in part from input they received from the flying community during a September 2019 most wanted list roundtable titled Alaska Part 135 Flight Operations, Charting a Safer Course. Now, while I'll be the first to say that our formal response is not yet complete, we're already taking several preliminary actions. We've brought in expertise from Alaska into the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee, including former Part 135 operators who are now at the FAA. In fact, the weather camera safety enhancement in the GAJSC came about because of participation by flight standards in the group. And we're heavily relying on the Alaskan region for expertise in studying and intervening in loss of, loss of control issues. In my conversations with your congressional delegation, we've also discussed the complex nature of aviation in Alaska and its many moving parts. Now also related to the NTSB recommendation is a provision in the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018 that calls for boosting safety by improving access to instrument approaches for Alaskan air carriers. The Senator talked about this as well. Now the idea here is to be able to use weather cameras or other technologies to assess local weather conditions typically monitored by weather stations. Section 322 was championed by the Alaska Congressional Delegation. We're continuing to work on guidance to make Section 20, 322 a reality and hope to have information out soon that will provide examples of weather element um, estimation techniques and training for non-certified weather observers in the coming weeks. This will include uh, updated guidance for our safety inspectors in Alaska regarding operators training programs and procedures related to weather observation. I wanna thank the Alaskan delegation for their leadership and their efforts on section 322. And I'm happy to report that we're getting very close. Now back to the panel. Um, for today, we're gonna to step back and look at the big picture. Uh, and this panel, uh, as Jeannie said, is about the state of the state. And, uh, and then we'll do three deep dives on the remaining panels. For our first panel, we're gonna talk about operations, safety trends, new entrants, activities at the state level, and air service and the industry at large in Alaska. And uh, I'll start the conversation uh, with a question for, uh, for Clark. Uh, Clark, given your position uh, in the FAA's Western Service Center, you're the perfect person to discuss some of the safety, security, and capacity challenges that Alaska sees that the rest of the country does not. So we'd be very interested uh, in your perspective on these issues. And again, welcome to all the panel members. Look forward to the conversation. Well, thank you, Administrator Dixon, and good morning to you, those of you in Alaska and in the afternoon for those of you in Washington, D.C. And before I begin my discussion, I do have three slides I'd like to show. Um, and as I go through this. So if we could bring up the first slide, please. I'll, I'll begin the discussion where they find the slide, uh, they go through it, but the slides basically show you, um, here we go, they're coming up now. Uh, air traffic operations throughout the NAS were steady until about the end of February 2020, and that's when the national health emergency hit, and then dropped significantly in the March and April timeframes. 
Um, now we've made some recovery over the, the period since April, but nationally we're still down about 35% in our traffic. Now Alaska uh, aviation weathered maybe slightly better, better with the national health emergency because aviation is a lifeline to many of the remote villages and towns. And across the state of Alaska, air traffic is still down a significant 20%. Now the largest impacts have been centered around uh, reduced tourism. For instance, the uh, Juno operations are down 65%. Air taxi operations appear to be hit the hardest in Alaska. Now Anchorage International Airport, Ted Stevens uh, International Airport, has been steady. Um, although they've seen reductions in their air taxi operations, their cargo operations have been up. Um, it should be noted that early in the National Health Emergency, Anchorage was the busiest airport in the national airspace system for several days in a row. Now the bar chart you see at the top of the graph um, is a month to month comparison over the past two fiscal years. And so the chart on the far left is October 18 compared to October 19. And then it goes November, December, January, um, February. And as you can see, we're pretty consistent across the years until we get to March. And like I mentioned before, when the national health emergency hit, we took substantial reductions across the board. Big hits in March and April for Alaska, as well as the rest of the country. And, and although we've some, some improvement, those initial reductions still were in place today. Now the data I'm showing you represents the eight busiest powered airports in Alaska. Now to the top right, the ATO is heavily invested um, in Alaska. We have 790 employees that live and work in the state of Alaska. We have one center, a couple of TRACONs, eight control towers, and 17 flight service stations, which are unique uh, to Alaska. We also have an Alaska regional office and have personnel there. And outside of Alaska, we have employees at the Air Traffic Organization's Western Service Center in Des Moines, Washington, that are dedicated to supporting the Alaska operations. Now, in addition to ATC facilities, the FAA has many other facilities. Um, in, the, in fact, we have about 2,300 facilities that support communication, navigation, surveillance, and weather. Now, engineering, installation, and maintenance is more difficult and more costly in Alaska. This is due largely to the remote locations, the terrain, and the environment. Now, the, on the previous one, there was a, if you go back to the first slide, um, we broke it into four categories, communications, navigation, surveillance, and, and weather. And as you can see uh, on the right side, I have a pre and a post. The pre is pre-national health emergency and the post is post uh, the health emergency. As you can see, um, been very minimal impact um, before and after. Um, and the, the um, ATO and personnel who install and maintain uh, these facilities work hard to maintain the highest level of availability in very difficult environment. And again, we've only seen minor changes and most of them well over the 90%. Now we'll jump to the next slide. Go ahead and go to the next slide. What this is, is really this our shock and awe slide. And it shows the 2,300 or so FA facilities across the state of Alaska that support the National Earth Space System. I will tell you, you will not see another state with this type of you know, infrastructure, the amount in the volume of facilities we have in one single state, but it is necessary given the terrain, the remoteness and the size of Alaska. Now, if we go to the third slide, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the safety trends. As both the administrator and the deputy administrator mentioned, um, safety is a continual journey and something that every FA employee keeps first when performing their work or making decisions. The ATO has many metrics that help us assess, monitor, and predict the risk in the system. Now, I've only included a, a few of them on this slide. Now, despite um, all the, the, it, the reductions in traffic uh, associated with the, the health emergency and everything in consideration, Alaska accident rates um, is trending in the right direction. We are not seeing any spike in safety metrics across the board for Alaska. As you would expect, many of our accidents are associated with takeoffs and landings. 
We did unfortunately have two tragic events, mid-air collisions that involved part 135 and part 91 aircraft in VFR conditions. We have seen a reduction in near mid-air collisions. One of the safety focus areas we addressed over the past year was reducing NEMAX in the Bethel area. The FAA led a collaborative work group of ATC personnel and industry stakeholders to identify ways to increase controller and pilot situational awareness. This was achieved through the development and charting of VFR waypoints, reporting points around the Bethel Airport. Also increasing the use of ADSB technology. We added a situational display in the Bethel Tower. We assigned permanent beacon codes to Bethel-based aircraft and held outreach meetings. Now the work group is continuing to meet quarterly and has committed to monitoring the safety metrics at Bethel. All of these efforts are making a difference with our near mid air collisions. Now, MBA violations are related to when aircraft enter airspace at lower altitudes than allowed. A lot of this is dependent upon terrain. Um, the more extreme metric of this would be the control flight in the terrain, um, which also has shown uh, improvements. Uh, this metric is tracked closely by the NTSB, and there were two events in Alaska in the last year. Both are still under investigations. Pilot deviations uh, are events where pilots have not followed ATC clearances and introduced a risk into the system. And significant events are basically uh, any event where there is sufficient risk that requires uh, follow-up action. Both of those, again, heading in the right direction. Many of the challenges that we face in the ATO in Alaska are associated with communication, navigation, surveillance, or weather. We have come a long ways from NDBs and colored airways to the ADSB, T routes, RNAV, RMP, and LPV approaches, but we still have a very long way to go. We are still using NDBs and color airways, and we hope that in the future those will go um, will be replaced with newer technology. But as we improve these capabilities, we lower the risk in the system and we improve safety. Now we have had uh, common improvements around the for the, we have four additional comm sites that have been approved um, for installation that'll help us with potentially lowering the minimum in route altitudes along airways and improving access for pilots who desire to file IFR. We have navigation improvements. Now publication and implementation of flight procedures across the NAS have been impacted by the national health emergency. Um, and to combat that uh, in Alaska, uh, flight operations based a flight check aircraft at Anchorage International Airport, and they were able to flight check 119 new or amended flight procedures in the last year. We are continuing to work on expanding the T routes in Alaska. We formed an Alaska industry and FAA work group, which recommended 48 new or amended T routes, and we are working on those today. And we continue to develop LPV approaches. The Galena VOR replacement project is scheduled to be completed next year, and that will provide critical navigation between Fairbanks, Galena, and Nome. Surveillance improvements. We're continuing to look at ADSB and expanding the network of uh, remote radio sites, and we're currently working on 20, 20 radio sites that will be um, improving uh, services in five service volumes. And weather improvements, we've mentioned this earlier, but we have eight planned AWASs for next year. Now, the other challenge HAO has faced is normalizing some of the new entrants into the system, such as commercial space and UAS. Alaska is one of the hotbeds for UAS activity. The University of Alaska is part of the integrated pilot program, as well as one of the seven UAS test sites. Over the past year, we have approved 32 certificates of authorization in support of Part 91 operations. Many of these are associated with the IPP and UAS test sites, along with the Department um, of Transportation Alaska and various law enforcement organizations. We have manually approved 47 of the more complicated Part 107 authorizations. These are small UAS uh, that are uh, requiring additional coordination for on airport or concurrent operations with manned aircraft or potentially waivers for beyond visual line of sight or nighttime operations. I will mention that hundreds are approved um, using the low altitude authorization notification capability or LANS. And lastly, Kodiak is home at Pacific Spaceport. 
and conducted a launch uh, last year of the Astra Space 3.1 rocket. Now, Steve, back over to you. Okay, thanks, Clark. And I, I think, you know, uh, thank you for going through that. I think it's a good, uh, a good start to level set. Um, and I think, you know, when we talk about uh, infrastructure, a lot of times uh, when you're looking at it from an operator's perspective, I speak from personal experience and, and also uh, going through the, the budget process uh, at the agency this year is, you know, the, the infrastructure, a lot of times that we, that we would see as operators, we think about things like runways and uh, airports, and those are very important. Those are funded through uh, AIP and, and other, uh, other investments but equally important to the agency. And actually, you know, if you look at two thirds of the FAs are traffic operations. And so we're an operator like an airline or, you know, any other, we're, we're running the aviation system, which is different than the other transportation modes. And uh, so maintain our infrastructure, our towers, uh, our radar facilities, uh, ADSB uh, installations, all of that. There's a pretty good uh, maintenance backlog, but it's also very important infrastructure. The weather cameras, you know, all those things have to be uh, maintained and keeping our people out there and enabling them to be able to do that important work in terms of installs and maintenance during COVID has been a, a challenge, but, uh, but hats off to, to everybody for doing that. So um, I want to move to John real quick. Um, John, I understand we may actually share a little common, common heritage from back in the day. So it's nice to see you. Um, but I, I mentioned the issue of uh, permafrost and runway condition uh, maintenance. And I, I went, uh, have actually, uh, you know, done a little bit in preparation for this to educate myself on some of the challenges uh, that you're seeing. Can you provide us a little more insight into, into what you're seeing and any other infrastructure uh, issues in Alaska, the efforts that are ongoing uh, from the Alaska uh, DOT's perspective or things that need to be happening that aren't happening at the state and federal level uh, to address them. Sure, I appreciate the opportunity, Administrator Dixon there. And uh, why has been mentioned a couple times already here, um, Alaska obviously has some pretty unique challenges compared to the rest of the country, and, and we're a long ways from Washington, D.C., so we sure appreciate the great partnership we have uh, with the FA Alaska region here. It certainly changes things when we're able to work directly with them as an individual state in this region. Um, and then big thanks out to Senator Sullivan and Congressman Young uh, as well. They've been tremendous partners and got some great things through the FA reauthorization bills there as well. Specific to the climate change piece, you know, a couple of the key items that we see up here um, is continuing uh, erosion, both along our coastal areas and then flooding areas through river channels and whatnot, um, and then degrading runway surfaces. So quite a few of our runways are built on permafrost. Uh, and as that line of thawing uh, continues to move further north there, that really raises havoc uh, with our surfaces. Um, we're working closely with FAA on trying on a couple of solutions or potential solutions. Uh, one is um, trying to get some adjustment on life cycle timelines there for eligibility product projects. We're finding we're, we're not uh, able to maintain uh, those surfaces as long as uh, other states are. Um, you know, a couple of fixes to this can be stockpiling material uh, as well. So we've got additional material available for some of that ongoing maintenance there. Uh, beyond what was maybe needed for the initial construction project. Um, and then also just uh, advanced engineering and geotechnical work there as well. We, we are working closely with AASHTO as well on the highway side, because as you can imagine, our, our roads are, are facing some of those same challenges as well. Uh, but really trying to approach that from several different aspects. Um, and that's really it for now on the climate change. I know we've got other topics there, so I'll uh, get back to you. Great. Um... You know, Leo, move to you for a moment. Um, I actually went online and, and uh, uh, wanted to educate myself a bit about Alaska's Aviation Advisory Board. So you've got a number of stakeholders, obviously, that uh, are on the board. Uh, so I don't want to, you know, I want to, certainly we would want to talk uh, today about all those perspectives. But starting from the air carrier perspective, 
you know, Alaska is a, a challenging operating environment. And we all know that. Um, and also, you know, it uh, doesn't have the population density uh, sometimes to get what some would traditionally look at as a return on investment for infrastructure. Again, I'm not sure that's the right way to look at things uh, in, in, up in Alaska. But um, having said that, you know, Part 135 operations we know are critical to keeping Alaskan communities connected to the world. There really is no other way. And uh, the right infrastructure is essential for maintaining the margin of safety that we want. So how do you, uh, how, do, how do the air carriers and, and how do you on the advisory board, you know, navigate um, through these issues and, and what are your top concerns? Thank you, Administrator, and thank you to our congressional delegation as well. I appreciate the previous two panel members. Um, you bring up a very good question. It's a dynamic question, and it kind of leads me into um, a broader conversation of, of the state of aviation in Alaska, and, and how do we describe that? As I talk to advisory board membership, it is a dynamic group of people. It's a broad-based policy recommendations for, this, for the state Department of Transportation, and ultimately to our governor. Um, we include tribes, communities, boroughs, municipalities, villages, and, and in talking to a lot of them and air carriers and the GA community, how do we describe aviation in a pandemic in Alaska? And it's essential. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that. You can't drive to a store, you know, you can't go to a shopping center, you can't drive to a higher level of care. Aviation up here is a balancing act, it's a lifeline, it's our only way in and out. And aviation's connection to the broader aspects of life, uh, like health, safety, and, and um, who we are as not only a state, but a nation, really ties into our community and our culture. And it's not, it's not so much that um, we operate aviation the same way we always have. It's not simple. It's no longer simple. You're not just flying a route from, uh, from A to B and then B to Z when the weather's good or when the risk analysis and the parameters of a flight release are met, it's how now, how do we keep our community safe? How do we keep the supply chain moving, our stores stocked, people's, people fed? Uh, how do we bring our customers to their appointments? Um, in Alaska, it's not just flying, it's sustainability of life. Um, climate, climate is real, climate change is real. And uh, over the past 20 years talking to our elders, I'm a new bath Eskimo from Unilakleet, Alaska and spent a lot of time um, out in the bush. And, and over the past 20 years, really, more so the past eight years, maybe the storms and, and the climate change and the coastal erosion, it's been drastic. You know, storms used to come in on the Bering, Bering Sea, they'd hop the chain and then they'd come in from the southwest. Now they're coming in straight from the west and straight from the northeast, northwest, and uh, pounding us. We don't have the sea ice to protect our communities. Coastal erosion is a, is a big thing. And uh, example of, of new talk moving to Methdivik or Matarvik um, is a whole community having to move. Then there's the safety, security, and capacity question. Um, you, brought, you brought that up. And history in Alaska is challenging, or history in aviation is challenging at best. History in Alaska is challenging. Whether you're a 91 operator, a 121 or a 135, the need to be safe and provide service um, and not only use tribal knowledge anymore, but technology and systematic approaches to safety, operations, organizational structure and culture are extremely important. So you have the infrastructure aspect of it and then the safety culture aspect of things. And how do we innovate and, and allow for this investment um, in our state? Our customers are mobile and global. You know, the Alaskas and the deltas of the world need feeders. They need people to feed yeah. their airplanes, especially in Alaska. You know, you're, you're running up here for a tourist-based economy um, in the summertime. Our baseline of being the aero nexus in, in the global economy is very important in cargo operations. And then there's this other aspect of, of rural aviation with a tough history. Regional 121s have a very, very tough history in Alaska, unless if you're um, Alaska Airlines. It's, it's a difficult operating environment. The social economic aspect of things is completely different than operating the lower 48. And in Alaska, for smaller carriers, we need a combo of innovation, infrastructure investment, new rules and regulation, but more importantly, sharing and transfer of knowledge. 
within the safety realm. I've talked to Marilyn Romano at Alaska Airlines at great, great length about this and how do the 121s like the Alaskas and the Deltas and the FedExes um, share their knowledge with the 135s who's feeding them for the common customer. Um, that's that's gonna be very important. And then there's the uh, age old capacity return on investment model. We lack the population to compete in Alaska. Where we can compete is innovation. The um, Senator Sullivan earlier spoke about the Bethel Bypass Mail Project. He spoke about bypass mail in general, but the Bethel Bypass Mail Project created and saved infrastructure investment for the Postal Service and created the most efficient Arctic and third world supply chain while meeting the universal service obligation for the nation, but the most efficient in the world from what I've seen. Again, um, in Bethel and Southeast Alaska, the capstone program became the national standard for next gen and ADSB. Weather cameras um, are, are something that started up here. And now we transition in this new model of what, what's next. Alaska doesn't have the ability to pass the ROI model for finishing ground-based infrastructure for our GBTs, for us to have a next gen ADSB system. It's time for Congress and, and uh, maybe the FAA to start considering new investment in space-based ADSB in Alaska, because we won't, we won't be able to compete on the ROI, standard ROI side. The same goes for airport infrastructure. Um, well, greatly appreciate the AIP process. We, we need some finances going into research and development into creating the new Arctic and, and the new climate change airports and runways. Um, you know, creating a 5,000, 4,000, 3 foot, 3,000 foot uh, high tech Arctic runway is a lot more efficient than trying to shoot for a, a 300 mile road and then using that information to create roads and create infrastructures. Weather cameras are one of our most valuable assets. Thank you, Walter and team. Uh, LPVs, thank you, uh, Joanne and uh, Ting Misun Ford and your team as well. You could shoot a, a LPV approach down to minimums in a town like Quigilinuk. Um, well, the approach is there, I need the weather reporting, but, but it makes it possible for these small towns to have access and access to the health and, and well being that the rest of the world has. And the UAS test bed in Alaska is, is uh, phenomenal. We're, we're ready for more investment in, in um, that type of technology, and we're appreciative for it. You know, lastly, we have a population that, we could, that can be described as the toughest people on earth. We welcome challenges, we embrace change, and we're the boots on the ground, you know, ultimately where it comes in to the first line of defense from the Eastern world. We see things on the ground, uh, my, my cousins and family and friends out West that, that even the military doesn't see. But it's important to remember that we are the boots on the ground. Aviation is essential in our state. We're sitting right here on the edge of tomorrow, ready for the next innovative idea to increase safety to not only our nation, but also the world. Well, thanks, thanks Lee, for that perspective. And uh, um, I want to make sure we've got some time for uh, you know questions that that may have come in from the participants here. I've got a couple more questions I could ask, but let's. Jeannie, let's move and see if we've got some uh, some questions from our uh, participants and all. We will uh, we'll have a discussion about them. Sure. Um, we actually, we, we have several here. Um, we have one for, this is for Mr. Bender, for John. Uh, Lee just mentioned drones. And this question is, uh, like most Alaskans who live in remote areas, drone deliveries of small parcels, medical supplies, and other products could be life-saving in some instances. What is the state doing to encourage drone use? I appreciate the question. Um, yep, that was one of the parts I was hoping to get talked about. We're very excited on what's happening up here related to uh, UAS. You know, Alaska was one of the original test sites as well through the University of Fairbanks, and we've been able just to uh, expand on that to dramatically. Uh, in fact, just this morning, we got approval for our statewide uh, COA now that allow us to operate as a public agency there across the state in essentially all the classes of airspace we have up here. Um, we do have a company that's uh, just finalizing their part 135 uh, certificate as well, specifically for cargo carrying uh, there. So that's one of the first in the nation. Uh, between that and the programs we have going through the test site, um, really we are enabling and very close to being able to do exactly that and provide unmanned deliveries to rural Alaska. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, here's a question for Clark. What does the future look like for the Alaska chart supplement? Will it stay updated? Okay, well, the Alaska chart supplement, and I figured a question might come up on this. Um, first of all, as part of a larger um, initiative that the FAA is undertaking, looking at aeronautical information and as well as notices to airmen. Um, and the concern is um, obviously in the, in the chart supplement is, is, is the information being maintained? Is it up to date? Is it accurate? Now, a lot of times we get information for the chart supplement, it's put in there, but then it is not updated or maintained by the person that submitted it. Now, I know that there's some concerns about the Alaska chart supplement. I'll tell everybody right up front that we put all efforts to reduce or remove things in the chart supplement on pause. And our intention is to work with the Alaska aviation industry to make sure that the chart supplement has the information in it that you want in it. Um, one size does not fit all, as Senator Sullivan said earlier, and we realize that, and the Alaska chart supplement is part of that but we also need to find ways to make sure the information in the chart supplement is one, appropriate, it's applicable, and it's accurate. And so we'd be working with the Alaskan industry to make sure that happens. Okay, thank you. Administrator, we are running short on time, so we've got more questions, but we will come back to those if we can later after some of the, the next panels. Um, we wanna take a, a brief intermission at this time, uh, just for 10 minutes. Um, and we still got a lot of ground to cover, uh, as I mentioned. So um, for, let's take a 10 minute break um, and we'll come back and pick it up uh, with the next panel. So see everybody in 10 minutes. All right, Thank thanks you. everybody. Thank you.
Okay, we'll give people just another minute to get back so we can get started. Okay, hopefully everybody is back. Uh, welcome back. Uh, next, we are going to enable uh, the live feed for our panel two moderator, Carrie Long. There he is. Hi, Carrie. Uh, Carrie's the regional administrator for the Alaska region. Um, and again, we're going to complete all of our panels before taking questions from the audience, but, but please keep sending the questions in and we will try to get to as many of those as we can. So let's go to Carrie in Anchorage. Hey, Jeannie, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, I'm, uh, my uh, bandwidth, I think, is giving me a little bit of trouble, but as long as you can hear me, that's fine. Hey, thanks a lot, Jeannie. Uh, what a great start. Uh, I can say from experience that none of the people you've just heard from are, to use a Navy analogy, uh, not fair weather sailors. They're with us through thick and thin, foul and fair weather, and, and uh, frankly, the... Uh, the consistency of the message that's coming down from the most senior leadership and obviously from the Hill has made the process of working on Alaska safety issues so much more successful. And I, and I certainly appreciate that. I wanted to thank your staff, Matt Ash in particular, and the regional administrator staff and Jackie Holtzman in particular for helping us to get to this stage. Uh, so fasten your seatbelts, what follows is gonna be my job is to take 12 people who have a lot to say and combine it into three 20 minute uh, panels. So I, I will do my darndest and, and Jeannie, I know you'll let me know if I'm not staying on, on our time limits, but I'll do my best. So each panel will have a different focus with, but the, there'll be common threads. Uh, we hope to have each panelist briefly set up a conversation uh, um, and that will then as they four finish their initial uh, presentation, uh, talk a little bit together, if we have time, about what each other said and, and try and help bring it all together to come up with those and uh, emphasize the common threads. So um, if things get quiet, which I can't imagine will happen with this, these groups, I'll pose some questions to the panel. And I can say that one question I'll probably ask is, what is the single most important thing we can do together to improve aviation safety in Alaska. Uh, I'll warn the panel as we reach the 15 minute point, And then as we approach the 20 minute point, ask the panel to wrap up after which I'll introduce the next panel. Uh, no questions during the presentations. Please submit your questions at any time and we will hold them until after, until all three panels are presented. Can you still hear me? Jeannie? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. okay so. Here goes, panel one, bridging the gap, national perspective and local implementation. And the panelists are Corey Stevens, co-chair of safe, the safety analysis team of the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee. Mike York, a FAA safety team program manager up here. Tom Candelario, runway safety program manager for the Alaska region. And Tom George, the Alaska regional manager for the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. So with that, uh, Corey, I'll ask you to, to present and then uh, turn it over to Mike and then Mike will turn it over to Tom and Tom to George. So please proceed. Sure, Carrie. thank you so much. Um, thanks everybody. Good morning to our um, friends and colleagues there in Alaska. Um, yeah, I'm gonna just uh, speak for a few seconds uh, on the uh, kind of what the, the national trends look like and, uh, and, and what we're doing to uh, kind of help combat uh, nationally and um, that will also have, a, have an impact regionally. So as, as the as Administrator Dixon uh, stated earlier, um, the trends are going in the right direction. Um, as you can see, the, uh, the first two charts are overall accident rate uh, in, both in the U.S. and in Alaska. And overall accident rate is all fatals and non-fatal accidents um, per 100,000 hours. Um, and then if we take a look at the fatal rates, uh, those are the next two slides. Um, once again, we're, we're, we're making progress. Um, the, the trends are definitely going in the right direction. 
Um, but when you compare Alaska to the lower uh, 48 and, 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 and uh, Hawaii, there's definitely some areas that we can uh, we can work and, and uh, make a, make improvement. Uh, one of the ways um, that we can um, start um, sh uh, shooting for that improvement is through uh, initiatives by working together. So I think one of the key ones is the General Aviation Joint uh, Joint Steering Committee. Um, and then, yeah, we can go off the, the, the charts now. Thank you. Um, so the, the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee, much like the Commercial Aviation Safety Team, um, is, a, is a kind of a, a means for the FAA and industry, uh, all segments of industry, to work together to um, uh, find, uh, find ways to mitigate uh, the risks that lead to fatal accidents and then work together to uh, develop non-regulatory means uh, to make those uh, mitigations, uh, make those mitigations happen. Um, the work has been very successful. The GAGSC rebooted in 2011. Um, since then, when you, if you looked at the fatal accident rate uh, slide, you noticed around 2014, we saw a dip in the, uh, in the uh, general, general aviation fatal uh, accident rate. Um, and a good, a good reason for that is all of us working together towards a single cause in this, a single focus. Um, now, leading to uh, kind of beyond the, the work of the GAGSC, um, uh, we learned a lot of, we, we wanted to learn, um, uh, we wanted to bring in a lot of lessons learned from Alaska. So we had um, participants both from the FAA side and from industry side come in and give us some demonstrations of, the, of success stories that you have had in Alaska, things that have worked. You've heard weather cameras mentioned earlier, they're gonna be uh, uh, talked a little bit uh, about later, but that was one uh, mitigation that we definitely adopted as a, as a safety, enhance, safety enhancement for the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee. Also, you've come up with some really unique ways and um, uh, great ways to get the safety message out and to communicate. So we've we've adopted some of that into our uh, into our safety plan. So we have to thank you um, for, uh, for for teaching us some of those those lessons learned. Uh, back in March, um, we were up briefing um, uh, the the uh, folks that attended the Alaska Air Carriers Association uh, meeting uh, was right there in uh, in Anchorage. Um, so a size has worked greatly with the uh, commercial uh, air carrier world for several years. It's a means to, to for all of us to look at, at all the different data sources that are out there, bring those together, and as a community look for those risks that could become the next fatal accident. Um, we, want to, uh, we want to build the representation and the membership that we have in Alaska. The more members we have, the easier it is for us as a community to look for risks, um, both nationally and regionally. Um, so we're, we're we're actually in the process of signing up um, some some operators and uh, carriers uh, in Alaska now, but we want to continue to grow that because that will help us as as a uh, as a community look for specific, some uh, specific issues and sorry specific risks that we can work on together and uh, and mitigate. And and that's the uh, that's the kind of the end of end of my uh, my segment. I'll turn it back over to uh, the panel. Over to Mike. Thank you, Mike. And thank you for Thanks, Mike. I'm muting here. Okay, yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, I've been in Alaska quite a while, actually, since it's been a territory. So I've seen a few changes. There's been a few bad things, uh, but mostly there's been a lot of good things. Um, our congressman earlier talked about uh, us being 80% roadless here. So for you folks visiting outside and for you, Steve, just think if we close down 80% of your highway system and your transportation system and your rail system, where would you be? Well, you'd be in Alaska. That's where we're at. So when you heard some of the other folks talking a little bit earlier about our infrastructure and how important and essential it is to us, that's just uh, one way to look at it. A lot of our folks um, don't go to the grocery stores in some communities, they go to the airport. That's how they get their, that's how they get their groceries. Uh, in Alaska here, we have three FISDOs. Those are flight standards district offices and their jobs are issuing 
uh, certificates and overseeing airmen and air agencies. I can tell you that right now we're operating at 100%. We are not at our physical address. We are at home or other work sites doing our work and we're able to accomplish everything 100%. So I'm pretty proud of that. I'll give you a quick example. We have CFIs. Those are certified flight instructors. Every two years, they have to be renewed. They used to come into the office, fill out an application. Our administrative staff would take care of it and move them forward. Today, we do it the same way we're doing right now at this summit. We do it via Zoom meeting. We uh, recognize their credentials, verify them, and move on. We also have rotorcraft certificates that we have to take care of here within the state. There are 24 month renewal too. Those are done the same way. Um, one other thing that we've taken on at flight standards here during COVID, um, we have two types of cert certificates that an air carrier can operate under, or uh, let's say you could fly an airplane under. One is an operating certificate and the other is an air carrier certificate. So let me give you an example of both here and show you what flight standards has done here to help out with the CARES Act. So let's say you have an operation at Lake Hood, Alaska, and you have five seaplanes. And right next to you is another operation has five seaplanes. They employ 15 people total. One is an operating certificate. The other is an air carrier certificate. With an operating certificate, they're not eligible for CARES dollars. With an air carrier certificate, you are. Kind of unfair given those circumstances. So what has our office done? We've worked with DOT, OST, and brought those other operators at their request up to an air carrier certificate. You know, that's, that's, that's a big, big direct economic impact. Um, the other part for the flight standards office uh, that allows them to operate at a higher level of safety. So we're glad to see that. Um, early this spring in Southeast Alaska, we have what's called a preseason air tour meeting. We get all the air tour operators together. Uh, the float plane operators that take the tours from the uh, 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 boats and the helicopter operators and have a meeting. Well, this year we had the meeting by Zoom and one might say, well, Mike, none of the cruise boats came. Why did you have the meeting? Well, at that point, we didn't know where we were in the COVID. I don't know if anybody knows where we're at right now. Uh, we'd sure like to see the economy get back to where it is. And so everybody was trying to be proactive and, uh, and um, work towards getting um, some preseason uh, discussions going. So out of that, we were able to talk about, uh, there was a midair down there last year and we we're able to talk about uh, some ways to mitigate the midair. So the time wasn't uh, wasted anyway in that way. Um, speaking of tourism, uh, just north of us of Anchorage here, about 150 miles, there's a place called Talkeetna, a big tourist operation for flight seeing of Mount McKinley. Uh, probably 20 plus aircraft operated out of there. Most of those are turbine aircraft uh, flying nine packs each. Um, 2020, we were required to have ADSB. ADSB is a radar type uh, environment where you have a screen in your cockpit, similar size to an iPad, and where you're able to see traffic come and go, altitudes, speeds, heading and other information. Those operators up there in 2019, one year prior to the requirement, voluntarily installed that equipment in their aircraft. The reasons why, we talked about the accident. So as several people have talked, including Corey, uh, those are the things we are doing to mitigate uh, some aircraft accidents. Hey Mike, apologies, um, we're just about out of time for you. Last comments? Yep, uh, just a quick comment. Uh, we have provided a fair amount of UAS outreach, so we're pretty proud about that. And we've done some runway safety issues at non-terror airports, so I'll turn that over to Tom. Thanks, Kerry.
one real quick comment before Tom is to, to those who think that that's a an image behind Mike that he put up. That's his act. He's actually in his hangar, and that's his airplane. And you'll he, you'll hear from Mr. White that he would they were going to go into competition, but Adam has decided I think to stay with the, his uh, his standard uh, backdrop. But thanks thanks a lot, Mike. Over to you, Tom. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name. Uh, first off, I'd like to say thank you for including me in this. Uh, very important panel, the Alaska Aviation uh, Safety Summit panel. I'm Tom Candelari. I'm the Alaska Region Runway Safety Program Manager. And uh, unlike Mike, uh, I wasn't here in Alaska uh, when it was a territory, but I got here just as soon as I can. And like most of you, I arrived here with the U.S. military. Uh, I worked air traffic control at uh, Ladd Army Airfield and at Allen Army Airfield on beautiful Delta Junction. All right. Uh, the, the Alaska Runway Safety Program, what is our mission? What is it we do here? Uh, the Alaska Region Runway Safety Program is intended uh, to improve runway safety by decreasing the number and severity of runway incursions, runway excursions, and other surface incidents. And uh, we do that primarily, and most importantly, at Alaska's nine towered airports. There's eight air traffic control towers, but we actually handle nine airports, and those are Anchorage International, Bethel, Fairbanks International, Juneau International, King Salmon Airport, Kenai Airport, Kodiak Airport, Lake Hood Seaplane Base, and Merrill Field. Okay. And uh, what we do is we collaborate with the Alaska Department of Transportation, the cities of Anchorage, Juneau, Kenai, the different FAA lines of, lines of businesses. And what we're trying to do is reduce the occurrence of uh, wrong surface landings, departures, and surface events. And how do we do that? Uh, the primary vehicle for doing that is an annual meeting that the towered airports are required to have. Uh, it's called the Runway Safety Action Team. And at those meetings, uh, we focus on wrong surface operations. And what we try to do is we try to heighten the awareness between the airport operators, air traffic control, and the flying community that goes in and out of those airports. Uh, granted, the majority of Alaska is not covered by air traffic control, uh, have air traffic control towers. The majority of airports in Alaska don't have air traffic control. And to address that, we have to address that, we have a pro uh, program that's unique uh, in, in the NAS. It's called our Flight Service Station Pilot Safety Program. And what we've done is, is uh, partnered with the flight service stations and we go to uh, flight service stations that, that are co-located on an airport and we have pilot safety meetings. And we try to do that is to heighten uh, surface safety awareness. And, and my program, we try to uh, concentrate on part 134, part 135 operations into those non-towered airports. We also partner with uh, Mike York uh, with the uh, FAA safety team uh, at, for WINGS conferences. And uh, our part of the WINGS conferences, we try to communicate what the FAA policy is and procedures that are specific to uh, runway safety. And we also uh, partner with the Alaska Airports Division uh, the Alaska Airports Division has a program called the uh, Runway Incursion Mitigation Program. And uh, what that program uh, uh, seeks to do is to address uh, poor airport geometry, poor runway geometry at, at Alaska's airports. And uh, we work with all these fine uh, uh, FAA lines of business, municipalities, and the Alaska Department of Transportation to address uh, surface safety here in Alaska. Over. Tom, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And nicely done. And, and now, uh, last but certainly not least, Tom George. Uh, thank you, Kerry. So kind of going back to the national perspective and local implementation, uh, we've heard some of the good examples of work that FAA is doing at the moment. And actually, I think FAA and industry have a long track record of working jointly in the state. Um, We've already talked about things like weather cameras and the initial prototyping of ADS-B before it went national. Um, we've also done work to change how we use common traffic advisory frequencies to try and reduce mid-air potential, as well as uh, worked with flight service to make an enhanced uh, reporting service so that if you have a satellite device and you're in trouble, that message can go straight to flight service to get a response. Um, but we still have challenges and to me, the structure of the FAA itself becomes a challenge and kind of still leaving us with a lack of an overall system engineering approach to the solutions to our problems. And I think this, this goes to the NTSB report that was mentioned earlier by the administrator. And if I could 
uh, talk about just three quick examples. Here are T routes, which are again replacing the legacy routes. And we have a, a segment of a route in Northwest Alaska where the terrain would dictate a 4,200 foot uh, minimum altitude. And yet we're looking at a 13,000 foot altitude to the best of my knowledge due to the lack of comms. This puts not only GA aircraft, but 135 operators that don't have icing equipment up into the ice. And there are some ways that I think we can, again, with a system engineered solution, work around it. These were articulated in a 2017 uh, report to the FAA. And yet I'm still reviewing today, in fact, uh, new T routes that we're looking at bringing out that, have so that we're still suffering from the same problem. If I go to the next slide, another uh, topic we've mentioned already is ADSB coverage. Uh, this is the current coverage at 3,000 feet above ground, the, the cyan or light blue color. And we looked at what we thought, industry thought it would take to get to a minimum operational network and sent a letter last year asking for 23 additional stations. It sounds like there's some movement on that and waiting to, to hear more. So yeah, we're still trying to get the infrastructure up to where we can actually use the modern systems. And finally, a very uh, current example on the next slide, if I can, the, we have a working group that's looking at adding chart or adding information on mountain passes or how to find mountain passes onto our aeronautical charts. We've had a working group now that's, that's been tackling this issue since January, and we're still trying to find a suitable flight standards policy level person or point of contact to actually work with us to see if we can take this recommendation that we've been developing and, and implement it. So those are just three quick examples of, of work that I think is very promising, but we have work yet to do and anything that can pull the different lines of business to the FAA together to focus on these issues, I think we'll see that we're spending our infrastructure money that, that Congress has we're in our congressional delegation has worked hard to promote as wisely as we can. Um, so with that, I wanna end just on one helpful or hopeful anecdote that I've certainly had some pilots recently contact me and indicate that they are, uh, they equipped with ADSB in initially, and now they see how many other airplanes are around them. And so even though rural airspace wouldn't dictate this, they're now starting to equip with ADSB out. So I think this is one piece of evidence that we are slowly working on improving the safety culture as well as the infrastructure in Alaska. And with that, I'll turn it back to Kerry. Hey, Tom, thank you. Thank you very much. We, we only have about a minute left. So I'll ask you, if I may, the question, what is the single most important thing we can do together to improve aviation safety in Alaska? I guess I think it is if we can establish some forum to be able to take the these issues like T routes or any one of these issues and come up with the most practical and affordable solution. That way, the way we're spending our money, I think would would advance safety and yet be responsive to to the resources we have available. Super. Thank you, Tom. Hey, panel, we have one more minute before we have to go to the second panel. Anybody want to make a last last minute comment? Yeah, I'll take that on, uh, Kerry. Uh, agreeing with Tom there, but uh, focusing a little more on it. The partnership between industry and the administration and the FAA is the only way we'll get the safety message done and completed. Little parts at a time are what I believe will make the whole system safety. Safer. Thank you, Kerry. Super. Thank you. 40, 45 seconds. Anybody? Murray, Tom? Uh, yeah, Tom Candelario here. Uh, we need to encourage uh, Part 135 operators to implement, even on a small scale, a safety management system. And mm -hmm. uh, we need to increase the amount of uh, ADSB uh, ground stations. And I believe Mr. Uh, Lee Ryan also addressed space based ADSB, which might be a a good possibility here for Alaska. Super. Tom, uh, Corey, last word. Yeah, the, the only thing I would uh, probably reiterate is if the more we can work together, the easier it will be to identify some of the issues. A lot of some of the same issues that were identified here um, earlier. Um, I do recommend if you're interested in, in a size, whether you're a private individual or an operator, 
contact us. And the more we have working together, the easier it will be to identify those issues. Thank you, Carrie. Panel, thank you very much. Okay, so we're on to panel two, Alaska uses of NAS services. And we have Andy McClure, staff support specialist for the FAA Alaska Flight Service. We have Walter Combs, who's the manager of the FAA Weather Camera Program. We have Dan Hickok, who's the Director of Surveillance Services, for the F FAA Program Management Office. And again, last but certainly not least, Adam White, who is in government and legislative affairs for the Alaska Airmen when he's not traveling all around the state all the time. So if we can kick off with uh, Walter, I'm sorry, with Andy, and then we'll go to Walter. Thank you, Kerry, and I'd like to wish everyone a good morning, or for those of you uh, not fortunate enough to be in Alaska right now, good afternoon. Flight Service's job is to help pilots manage information, weather, critical data, anything else they need and want, and to provide assistance uh, when and where it's needed. Leveraging technology in collaboration with pilots and entities both within and without the FAA uh, will allow us to facilitate and maximize the intake by flight service and output of information for the benefit of the pilots. Uh, if I could ask for uh, slide number one to come up on the screen. Andy, we're not going to be able to do that, so keep on going without uh, your slides. Oh, today. okay. Um, we're working to preserve the best of our legacy resources and develop uh, new delivery pathways. Um, I've got four subject areas. PIREP improvement, uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, the ESRS, uh, which in brief finds flyers faster say that five times real fast. Uh, digital information. And last but not least, uh, again, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the Alaska chart supplement. Uh, we're working passionately in all those different areas and I'll be happy to elaborate more on those later on. Back to you, Carrie. Hey, hey thanks, Andy. And now we're over to Walter Combs. Hello, thanks, Gary. Um, uh, so we know that commercial and private operations are impacted by the lack of available weather information, METARs, terminal aerodrome forecasts, uh, and other weather information. Uh, the resulting impacts uh, in, uh, uh, to, to increased, uh, uh, the resulting economic impacts, increased accident rates, <clears throat> and widespread operational impacts increase each year with the growth of Alaska communities and the expansion of the aviation operations. <clears throat> we know that in Alaska, there's quite a number of, of airports uh, and locations where METARs do not exist. Uh, this, the airports division is working uh, here in Alaska with the state of Alaska uh, DOT division to install AWASs, but the cost of the systems and the severity or the the, the uh, severe conditions that they've got to install those systems in really limit the the number of sites that we can put in on any uh, timeline. Um, <clears throat> so as uh, as Administrator Dixon had mentioned, the 322 legislation will allow operators. To, uh, to access airports where METARs do not exist using uh, advisory type information or non-certified METARs. <clears throat> In direct support of the legislation, the FAA's Flight Standards Group began working with us, the Weather Camera Program, to develop a new weather platform called the Visual Weather Observation System. It's uh, VWAS is the acronym for that system. This new low cost advisory weather platform combines weather cameras into an automated self-checking and self-validating weather station. The new automated capability ensures data accuracy and integrity and is monitored on a continuous basis, immediately reporting any data errors or discrepancies. And it's important to understand that the VWAS platform does not replace or compete with AWAS 
systems. Rather, it's intended to support the provisions of section 322 and 516, providing pilots with validated, safe and accurate advisory weather information for access into airports where METARs do not exist. The VWAS is currently under development, test and analysis. Uh, it's sponsored by the Flight Standards Organization and funded through AFS 410 TCRG funds. Uh, we're currently installing the systems at four Alaska airports, Palmer, Eek, Tatitlik, and Healy River. All four airports possess, possess IFR instrument approach procedures, but do not possess a METAR. The test and analysis period will be conducted this winter through the fall of 21. Uh, once validated, we'll push for approval and funding to implement VWAS systems at airports where METARs do not exist. This will help to improve aviation access, safety, and efficiency in the state of Alaska. So with that, Carrie, I think uh, I will hand it back to you, sir. Hey, Walter, hey, hey, thanks very much. I know, it's, I know it's hard because each of you has programs that are just so amazing. We, we could talk for hours on it. So now for the, for the third Dan in sequence, uh, over to Dan Hickok. Good morning, everybody. Uh, that does seem to be a popular name here today on the, uh, on the webcast. Glad to be another Dan in the list. Um, it is my privilege to be the, um, uh, to have responsibility for the ADSB program. Um, and I, I love to see all the energy here today regarding ADSB. And I'm glad to take all those, uh, those arrows and questions as we move forward here in the, in the talk. Um, 2020 has been a huge year for us on the ADSB program office because we passed the mandate date. And uh, that really signals that the system is completely integrated into our air traffic control system. It's completely operational and it's delivering benefits. And much of that success is owed to the early um, investment in the capstone program and the uh, participation from the state of Alaska in helping us set that foundation for the ADSB program. So the, the benefits that we currently deliver today as part of that, uh, part of that system uh, first of all, we have surveillance of aircraft where we didn't used to have it. Uh, we have better data and more frequent data, uh, which makes our traffic control system safer. Um, we have correlated that aircraft, uh, general aviation aircraft that are equipped with ADSB have a lower accident rate. That is a huge benefit. Uh, so part of that decrease that you that you what we've talked about earlier is due to the fact that we have ADSB equipment on more aircraft. And that provides weather and traffic information directly into the, uh, into the cockpit, which makes, um, makes flying safer. So what, what a great thing to, uh, to be able to say we've, we've, uh, we've accomplished all that. And well, uh, you know, really as of this year, uh, but it really is signals the start of uh, more great things in the future, right? So it's, it's not the end of the 8HB story, it's really just the start. And this foundation that we've built um, allows us to project into the future and really consider some very exciting new stuff that will be coming in the next few years. Um, first of all, for um, Anchorage International, we have a state-of-the-art uh, surface surveillance system uh, that's about to become operational here uh, any month, uh, very soon, which uh, goes to that runway safety topic that we heard about earlier. We're gonna use uh, ADSB more in search and rescue. So if you can pinpoint precisely the location of a downed aircraft, it literally can mean the difference between life and death. Uh, we use uh, ADSB for improving conflict resolution in our air traffic control systems. Uh, we have future applications like trajectory-based operations and interval management using ADSB in. Uh, so, so very exciting stuff. Uh, Space-based ADSB was mentioned, uh, which is a really interesting technology that can have applications throughout the United States, to, uh, over oceans, uh, in offshore environments, over mountains, and so on. So it's a very exciting application that we continue to investigate. And uh, we do plan on the expansion of ADSB um, uh, with the hopefully successful final investment decision for additional radios in Alaska in 2021. So I'm very excited about that prospect of bringing more service volumes, so more, more um, uh, volume of airspace covered by ADSB in the future. Uh, so the future's very bright. 
but uh, just as a reminder, ADSB is a cooperative system, so it does depend on people equipping with ADSB to get the benefits. So I highly encourage that. Back to you, Carrie. Hey, Dan, thank you very much. And over to Adam White. Yeah, appreciate it, Carrie. And uh, as you mentioned uh, there at the beginning of the introduction, I, I do spend the majority of my time um, out flying around in the state. Um, and my role as government and legislative affairs with the Alaska Airmen's Association, I interface with a lot of our membership, a lot of the users of the, the NAS that we have here in Alaska. And most of our membership is VFR. Uh, we, we don't fly IFR because where we're going, um, like myself, most of my operations are off airport. And so uh, an instrument approach, uh, the, the airway route structure, uh, while is helpful to a certain extent, is, um, is somewhat limited to, to fulfilling our needs. And so that's why programs like Flight Service, uh, the ESRS program that Andy mentioned, uh, the Weather Camera program has been a huge, huge uh, benefit for us as we operate in the VFR environment uh, here in Alaska. And a lot of folks have heard me say these things that I'm about to talk about, uh, and it's, it's kind of one of those stump speeches and, and soapboxes that I tend to get on, but uh, what we have here in Alaska is, as I've mentioned uh, in previous times, that a limited infrastructure, and that's going to come up in the next round, uh, but the infrastructure we do have is somewhat aging, and so that's a continuing problem that, that we work with the FAA on. Uh, probably one of the biggest wins that we've had when we talk about infrastructure and our needs for that, but yet the, the lack of it that we have here in the state and the business case model uh, that the FAA has used traditionally is, has been problematic for us. And, and I think everybody knows that and understands that. And, and there's been some talk of changing that and there's some, some modifications to that. But the innovation that, uh, that I, I got to give credit to a lot of the folks in the FAA um, for trying to find solutions to the problems that we have with limited budgets, limited uh, ability to get out and do things when we do have money and then limited things to install, uh, if, even if we could get there. And so the SBS office with the look ahead range issue that we have uh, with ADSB um, is, is problematic for us because we just don't have a fully deployed minimum operational network of ADSB stations. But to the SBS office credit, um, they went ahead at our request and, and other folks in the industry to uh, reevaluate the limitation of the amount of data that was being broadcast by those stations. And to their credit, they, they agreed with what we were saying. They, they understood the problem. Uh, we didn't have the bandwidth concerns that the lower 48 does. And so we've been able to increase that look ahead range. And so now, while we may not be in range of a ground station all the time, when we are, we're able to get data for areas of the state where previously, even if you could see a, a ground station, there was no data being broadcast to you about where your destination may actually be. Um, and so, a lot of the things that we struggle with um, as VFR pilots is while there's no legal mandate, no requirement for us to have official weather at an airport, we appreciate having it. There's no requirement to have an airport lighting system for day VFR operations, for the type of flying that we do. But I got to tell you, there's not a sweeter sight in the world than having a pappy show up and reduce visibility when I'm coming in VFR when I come home. So our members really do benefit and enjoy the things that the IFR infrastructure mandates. And our concern is that a lot of these things through the years has taken that risk that has been spread over the entire NAS, not just here in Alaska, but in the lower 48, and has been paring that down. The risk is still there. It's just no longer being carried by the NAS and it's being put on the shoulders of the individual pilot in the cockpit, in low light, in reduced visibility. Um, and so it's a bigger workload. And so we rely with cockpit resource management, um, even though we're single pilot, we rely on folks like flight standards and flight service. Uh, we rely on them to tell us what they see in the cameras. We rely on them to, uh, to give us that information. We also rely on ADSB. So a lot of good wins. Sorry to say we have a long way to go, but uh, looking forward to what the future holds. So Carrie, back to you. Well, thank you, Adam. You, you've sort of brought, strung together a, num a number of these issues. What, what's the single most significant issue for you up here in terms of aviation safety that we can work together on? Well, I think you just said it, work together. Um, and I do appreciate the, the great relationship we have a lot of, with a lot of folks in the FAA. I think one of the biggest things that I saw as part of the capstone program 
that I wish we could get back in place. And the NTSB has made this recommendation that we have a unified um, cross platform, um, different lines of businesses all coming together in a single point person that we can attack issues and then be able to have everybody in the room to be able to figure out, okay, who's going to be tasked with taking care of this, even though it may not be their wheelhouse, they know whose wheelhouse it is and they know who to go to talk to and, and to get that problem addressed. And I think that that open communication and then the, the ability to go across the lines of business within the FAA is going to be a huge benefit for us. Well, fabulous. And thank you for that. If a uh, question to Andy, um, sure. can you just talk a little bit about the role of the flight service station and how it's evolved and how it helps people like Adam as a single pilot in his, in his uh, relatively small aircraft trying to, trying to get by? <laughs> sure. Um, flight service has, I think it's three, maybe four times as many communication outlets in Alaska as en route does. Um, we use those extensively to help pilots like Adam. Uh, what we want to do, though, is to leverage satellite communications and Wi-Fi and cellular, uh, all of which have some part of the coverage of Alaska. Um, and if we can, unify those with uh, air, uh, equipment in the aircraft to make sure that a pilot can communicate with us um, no matter where they are in the entire state. Um, despite the fact that Alaska has a lot of frosting on it fairly frequently, uh, we're not a pastry. Uh, despite the fact that we're not pastry, we have a whole lot of donut holes up here and we want to fill those in. Well put. I've never heard that analogy, Andy. It's part of the donut holes, but nothing else. But thank you for that. Just a quick over to Walter, and then we'll get to Dan. Any any uh, summary comments, Walter? What what do you think is most important up here for safety? Uh, well, I've always been focused on weather, so weather infrastructure. Uh, we have uh, we have the gold standard. That's METARS. Uh, that's the gold standard out there, and, and we need to maintain that gold standard. We need to implement those systems where, wherever we can. We need a silver standard. We need that second level of weather. Right now, we've got a METAR, and then we just have all the rest of that weather. What we want to bring in uh, with, with myself and, and flight standards is we want to bring in the silver standard, and that is accurate, validated weather that is not a certified METAR low cost, something that can be implemented and maintained to supplement that gold standard. Right now, if we just leave it to the system that we've got now, any weather is good weather. And if anybody's familiar with infrastructure, they know a lot of weather systems are not adequate or safe to use. So we wanna bring that to the equation. And that's what this VWAS is, is it brings a silver standard. So with that, Carrie, I'll hand it back to you, sir. Yeah, real, real quickly before we go on to Dan, I don't, I don't want to short the weather camera program itself. How are you doing on the weather camera program? Are you looking for, for any, do you have a need for additional weather camera sites, so on and so forth? Okay, yes. So uh, as a part of the VWAS, there's 60 locations that we want to establish new camera systems at. Now the VWAS is combined it's a weather camera system combined with a validated weather station. So this, this VWAS will provide ceiling and visibility, pressure, winds, all the information that's, that's normally associated with a METAR uh, will be a part of this. So right now of about 112 locations, there are 60 locations that, that, have, have, that don't have cameras and the remainders do have cameras. So we would put a VWAS at those locations, about 112 locations, and 60 of those will have additional cameras on them. So I, I hope I described that well enough. But yes, indeed, Alaska gets more cameras. Um, and we have, we're in the acquisition process to start get, to requesting funding uh, to expand the weather camera system throughout the state of Alaska. 
at locations where we need those systems. Super, Walter. Thank you very much. Dan, do you want to sum up the panel and tell us anything you'd like to tell us? I do, I do want to answer one of the questions that came in on chat that I saw there about what's the process for more ADSB in Alaska. Um, we, we have a process uh, of going through a cost benefit analysis. We're in the middle of that process right now. Uh, we bring that to what we call our Joint Resources Council, who are the senior decision makers in the FAA. Hopefully get a thumbs up that, uh, that they approve that uh, investment. Uh, we expect that decision to be in June of 2021. And then if we have a favorable outcome to that decision, um, uh, then we move forward. And it's fairly quickly, quick after that, that we can deploy service volumes after that time that we get approval. So we hope for that in 2021. Um, I, I did want to just have one uh, go back to, to Adam's comment there. He mentioned uh, uh, the need for uh, sort of a unified forum across uh, functional discussion regarding problem solving. Um, I fully support that because if we're hearing directly from, from people as to what the, the issues are that we need to solve, we can get to those solutions faster. So I fully support that. I think that example of uh, working together to extend the range of data available through ADSB is a really good one. So there's probably other solutions out there that we can we can bring to bear. So glad to play a part in that. Super, Dan. Thank you. And I think folks in high places are listening. <laughs> so with that, thank you, panel. On to panel three, supporting Alaska infrastructure needs. And the uh, we're four uh, participants, Christy Warden, who's director of Alaskan, the Alaskan Region Airports Division. Jim Linney, director of operations support for the FAA Tech, Tech Ops, essential service up here. Kyle Christensen, flight procedures team for the Western Service Center operations support group, but he's based up here in, in Alaska and been here forever, I think. And of course, Matt Atkinson, who's president of the Alaska Air Carriers Association. So without further ado, Christy, why don't you kick it off? All right, thank you very much, Carrie, and to all of our stakeholders out there. Uh, I'm Christy Warden. I'm the director of the Alaskan Region Airports Division, and our office invests funds from the uh, Aviation Trust Fund into public use airports in the state of Alaska. We build infrastructure. We invest these funds through the airport sponsors to build runways, taxiways, aprons, etc. To make the infrastructure the best it can be in Alaska. And we're definitely dedicated to that. This panel is going to talk about a success story. We're going to talk about something that has tremendous innovation, collaboration, and real good partnership, not only amongst the folks that you see on the panel here, but importantly with our stakeholders in Alaska to effect uh, the placement of additional AWOS, Automated Weather Observation System units in Alaska. But importantly, uh, these new AWOS units will be accepted by the Federal Aviation Administration for the ongoing ownership and maintenance. We refer to that as a takeover, an FAA takeover of AWOS, uh, the new installations. This is very important because we put ourselves in the proverbial shoes of our airport sponsors, our airport owner operators, and there's not always available funding to, uh, to fund the ongoing maintenance of these units. Clearly, this initiative is rooted in safety. Unfortunately, we've had too many instances in the state of Alaska controlled flight into terrain, NTSB safety recommendations from accidents, uh, that lead us to exactly what we all know. We need more reportable weather in the state. We need more AWOS units. And that's what this is all about. Uh, so we're going to hear from the panel today about an effort uh, initiated by the Alaska Air Carriers Association through the, the congressional, the Alaskan congressional de delegation uh, to include for the first time ever included in the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018, FAA's takeover of AWOS units. We're going to hear from Lenny and uh, Tech Ops about exactly what that takeover looks like, how practical, what the practicalities are. We're going to hear from Kyle Christensen about flight procedures and the fact that FAA has 
authored many flight procedures that are presently not available due to lack of reportable weather or how these AWOS units will open up access, open up the infrastructure. From my perspective, my office, we are the funding mechanism for these AWOS units. And it's through the Airport Improvement Program, the AIP program. We've heard a number of speakers talk today about the importance of AIP. That's my office. We're glad to do it on behalf of the administration, on behalf of the agency, uh, under the tremendous assets that our congressional delegation affords FAA in the authorization and appropriation legislation uh, so that we can roll these monies out. We are grateful for that. We're grateful for supplemental AIP and every dime makes a difference in our ability to fund these units. You've seen a slide come up on the screen with eight AWOS units. These are the eight that were just put under grant this summer by our office. And we were able to do that because of supplemental airport improvement program funding that came to us from Congress. These are the first eight units of what we've heard before in our safety summit today from Senator Sullivan uh, and anticipated 35 units. So these first eight we have funded, they are, it's with the partnership with Alaska Department of Transportation, which owns and operates these airports. Uh, they've been put to grant, they're in the process of procuring the units and uh, doing the install and uh, as soon as that procurement and the installation is done, then they'll be working very closely with Jim Lenny and his crew. Ultimately, there's more to do. There's more work to accomplish here. We've got another approximate 25 to 28 of additional AWOS units that our office wants to be able to put under grant uh, for the FAA to take over. And uh, at this point, I, I think, let me hand it, before we go to Jim though, let me hand it to Matt Atkinson to talk about the tremendous effort on behalf of Alaska Air Carriers Association to effect what is really an innovative program. Okay, over to Matt. Uh, can't hear you, Matt. So do we have any technical? Can you hear Matt? Anybody? Negative. Okay. Uh, okay, hit that, let's try that. Nothing from Matt. Um, Matt, why don't we work on your getting your sound back and then Christy, may we go on, maybe check with Jim and then can we figure out, may, uh, we get our, uh, Matt Ash is, is, is our, I think that'd be great. That'd be great, Carrie. We can certainly go to Jim if Matt is, is, oh, do we hear Matt? Not yet. Uh, no, not yet. If Matt's able to come back on, that's great. Otherwise, I, I'd be glad to represent uh, what his organization, his association, what they were able to accomplish. Okay. Hey, Matt, keep playing with it. If, if, if you butt in, that's fine. We'll, we'll accommodate. But we, you've got something to say. We want you to say it. So keep trying. And then our folks, Matt Ash and the folks will work with you to, on that. So meanwhile, over to Jim Lynch. Anything now? Yep. Try, Matt? Did you hear anything now? Yes, we got gotcha. you. Okay, so hold on, Jim. All right, oh. if we're, we're live. Yeah, there was one button, I guess, that we had to change a little bit. So anyway, what it was starting to do, and thank you, Christy, for the, the great introduction and for organizing the panel and getting all the work done ahead of time. And um, thanks to the FAA and you know, our delegation for organizing this and uh, inviting us. We've covered a lot of territory today and um, there's a lot of information. So we're looking forward to you know, having some good follow-up in correspondence with, um, with everybody. But the, the three main things that we want to focus on as the Alaska Air Carriers Association. One, the funding of volunteer safety programs. Uh, two, is the focus of this panel is expanding and improving the IFR infrastructure, and then three, strengthening the FAA. Um, I think that we have established, and we've talked about it earlier uh, in the program today, that we have a good paradigm in place and um, proven we can get things done working with FAA, and we just need 
more, more resources and more focus. Um, going back to the first thing, I think that uh, we believe that we would like to seek some of the negative impacts we've had with the loss of medallion and to develop and implement system safety and SMS programs for smaller operators, which for the larger operators that are scaled up, they have a little bit more resources to be able to deal with that, but it's not true for many of our smaller 135 operators. Or... Um, separately, in order to offset the high subscription costs of fee service for SMS platform providers, we would like to advocate that insurance underwriters uh, offer reductions for increasing these expensive premiums for our, our operators. Um, it's going to be a big issue for us in industry is the, the lack of uh, carriers or lack of uh, underwriters in the state at that expense, you know, especially in the face of some of the challenges that we've talked about earlier. Um, other thing we've heard about all of the, the mantra of one level of safety used for, you know, everybody across the nation. And, and I think uh, Senator Sullivan did a nice job of recognizing that it's, it's different up here. So when it comes to IFR infrastructure, we need to you know, focus on automated weather stations, ATC communications, ADSB ground uh, coverage, NextGrad radar coverage, as well as instrument approaches um, to be able to get us playing on the same field as, as everybody. And then finally, you know, we do think that the uh, strength in Alaska region with the authority to advance initiatives specific to Alaska's unique geography, weather and infrastructure challenges will be something that, and finally, you know, as we're having these summits, we had a great summit before, um, but we wanna make sure that we can capture these ideas and uh, make action on them. Matt, thank you. you you're going in and out a little bit, but I, I heard just about everything. So I think we're, we're doing fine. So we'll, okay. we'll come back maybe on a follow-up and next uh, we'll go to Jim Linney. A sound check, can you hear me okay, Gary? Yes, certainly. Great, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of the session today. Um, I'll, I did a little research like many others in preparation for today. And I think the discussion around AWOS um, is in and of itself part of our challenge. Um, but I will say that I'm, ex uh, and I'll explain why in just a second. Um, the cooperation between airports, the state of Alaska, Alaska Air Carrier Association and others for this first of type has been uh, nothing short of extraordinary. Uh, Christy did a great job of articulating that. Uh, airports at the centerpiece of this has really done a great job of pulling us in. Um, we have done a lot of work in Alaska. Uh, we know Alaska well. Our technicians live in Alaska. They fly in the same aircraft in Alaska. Uh, they have the same and experience the same challenges as the community does up there because they are the community. Uh, so there's a great passionate uh, connection that we share in our partnership for aviation safety in Alaska. Uh, there isn't anybody who flies in Alaska doesn't know somebody else in Alaska who's been impacted by an accident in Alaska. So uh, know that we are with you uh, on that. Um, this new opportunity to deploy AWOSs in locations that don't have them is a great opportunity. And uh, we are gonna work together to make sure we can accept those systems on time. How it works is the airport gets the funding, they go through the normal process they would for a non-fit installation, and then the FAA at the end, after it's certified and checked out, we take over the maintenance. Um, that is not without its challenges. So in Alaska, we're innovating on new telecommunications for these sites, uh, which will help us improve the ability that the number one interruption for AWASs in these locations is telco, because as many as you know, the, those locations are very remote and sometimes go through two or three parties to get telco established. So um, not only are we innovating on our approach to take over maintenance of these systems, we're also innovating on the technology as well to learn more about these locations, including how should we build them, design them, and install them and maintain them more efficiently than maybe we've done in the past. Um, I'll say one thing that I, just to close out and then I'll hand it back to you, Carrie, to hand to others because I know I want to leave some time for Q&A. Um, th th it was said on panel one, I think it was Tom, um, but it was a, a very uh, astute comment and one I just, it resonates with me a great deal. Uh, and, and Walter said it as well. We really have to figure out a way to work together instead of looking through a catalog for the right acronym to install in a location. Maybe we need to take some of the Alaska innovation and invent our own acronym. Uh, the gold standard, silver standard, what works the lower 48 doesn't necessarily fit in Alaska. This is where I think us talking more and engaging directly, we can engineer solutions that fit the need and only the need. Uh, we do not need to install systems in Alaska because it just happens to be the same acronym in the lower 48. Yes, it requires us to innovate. Yes, it requires us to change our training, 
but we can do those things if we partner together. So um, you have our commitment to not only accept these eight systems on time, uh, to continue to accept the new systems, but also hopefully a new partnership or renewed partnership to trying to find ways to engineer solutions that fit the need together. Back to you. Uh, thanks, Jim. And, and I, I don't think there's anybody on the call who doesn't understand the, the role of the tech ops folks as they go out. They somehow the, the COVID has affected them, but only to, to, to maintain the, the essential systems. And now they're going back out there and they're like the, the leaders of the group, along with the, the pilots and so on. So thank you for that. So Kyle, over to you. Thanks, Kerry. That was uh, pointing out how uh, we could use Alaska specific uh, installations is a, a great move. Um, over the last two decades, the FAA has heavily promoted IFR flight to Alaskan aviators, and we've been mostly successful, um, especially in recent years with the maturing of RNF procedures combined with operator equipage. For the last 12 years, I think the FAA in partnership with the state of Alaska and the industry have pursued a lot of means uh, and efforts to acquire, install, and and maintain approved uh, automated weather systems at rural Alaskan airports to facilitate the use of instrument procedures, uh, primarily for our part 121 and 135 operators. Um, that's where on airport weather, uh, weather reporting is required. Those efforts have been mostly successful, mostly. Um, we've come up short. Uh, the recent success with eight uh, Christie's eight AIP, uh, AIP funded AWAS locations is great and it may signal a shift in the tide. Um, we have another 18 airports with published procedures, no on airport weather. So those, uh, those IFR procedures, which we promote to mitigate CFID incidents are mostly unused. Um, this doesn't take into account the large number of VFR airports across the state, which would qualify in, uh, for instrument procedures, but they're not sponsored because of the extremely limited use they would get without an on airport weather system. We've made big progress in recent years with um, getting aeronautical surveys at these airports and publishing LPV procedures and T route development, uh, but we haven't yet achieved uh, safe IFR operations where where we need them, not everywhere. Uh, between the FAA and the state of Alaska and industry, we need, to, we need to stay focused and stay cohesive on our evolving infrastructure, which is um, aging systems and integrating new technologies. Uh, increased communications, NAVIGS coverage, surveillance capabilities, they're all needed. But without the on airport weather systems, Alaskan operators will continue their access to VFR airports without the safety benefits of a robust IFR infrastructure system. So um, the linchpin is really on airport weather systems that are validated or certified. Kerry? Super. Thank you, Kyle. Well, and nicely put. So why don't we come back to Matt Atkinson? Do, uh, you want to start to wrap up a bit on, on uh, issues? Issues of interest to you and, and the single most important issue for you? I know you have a number of them, but. Yeah, we, we do, you know, and again, just in, or we, I know we have limited time here, but the, the importance of, you know, urging the administrator Dixon to consider restoring a, you know, strong uh, FAA Alaska region. Um, we still have uh, many more, more uh, 120 unweathered locations Supplemental AWAS, big deal for all of us. I mean, we cannot emphasize the structure. And I think it came up in the questions too. Um, Darren Young was that uh, we need we to uh, have We're a Pardon? We have a little trouble hearing. You just lean in a little bit and see if that helps. Okay. Yep. I'll keep in. Yeah. Sorry, my face has got to be so close then, but apparently. Uh, but where are we on with updating TERPs for the approach design um, using current technology? Maybe that's a question for Kyle. Well, TERPs is always evolving and it happens slowly. Flight standards, vets, everything uh, with a fine tooth comb. I think that um, we're making slow 
um, strides. We have some uh, really good high tech folks working on some great solutions, advanced RMP um, solutions, even with low end avionics, we're gonna, we're gonna make this happen. I don't think it's gonna be a quick turnaround, but we do have our flight standards, uh, compatriots focused on these things. It's gonna happen. Uh, it's just not gonna happen uh, this week. So, Fair enough. Go ahead, Max, you can follow up if you want. Okay, and then so that yeah, the instrument approach procedures are going to be, be great. And then we also support expansion of radar weather on the north slope, uh, the Alaska Peninsula and much of the interior. Um, expanding this ADSB service provides the radar weather in cockpit and to install new and updated communication systems to maintain low MEAs for route structures and fill gaps. Um, I think we spoke about it earlier in the conference that we have an, an uh, example was out of Talkeetna, everybody being ahead of the curve on ADSB in and out. And we found that to be very successful too. We've deployed that in all of our aircraft, especially on the Navajo side. And it's something that, uh, but without the, with the, the, there's gaps in the coverage. So that's something maybe we want to. Thank you, Matt. I have a feeling we'll be hearing, hearing more. You'll be hearing more from us and us from you. Just quick question to Jim, then a, a quick question to Christy, and then we'll, we've got a few more minutes for together. So, so Jim, we, I, I don't, I don't think you passed out when somebody said 35 more of these, but how, how does how does the tech ops staff support uh, additional AWASs that, that they will uh, be maintaining? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, it is not without struggle. Um, the workforce up there is extremely capable. Um, I've had the great pleasure of meeting many of them, um, going to sites with them and their passion and commitment to that is is legendary. Um, they oftentimes have to overnight uh, go into these locations because of where they're based. Sometimes it's a two, three days, sometimes they're weathered in, and that makes them unable to go to other sites that might have needed an inspection or a restoration as well. So it is a challenge, uh, and it becomes an exponential challenge as we add more stations. Uh, I will tell you, though, is uh, I, we have strong support inside the organization uh, for the air traffic organization as well as uh, the, the administrator down where we need to put resources to bear to make sure that we have safe systems running. Uh, there's not been a request that uh, we have asked that has been turned away. So uh, I know we'll need to change some of the staffing profiles on able and we'll need to change some of the posture there. Um, and and we'll, we'll address those as they come up. There is going to be some need for common community patients, right? As we're evolving here, we're gonna learn and we're, we're gonna need all together to work together to, to understand that as we bring on these new systems, we have to grow to absorb them. So a little bit of patience, a little understanding uh, is all that we're gonna ask for, but we're gonna do our best to, to make it work better. Um, one other thing, Carrie, that we're gonna look at is we're trying to move to a more remote capability. If there's things we can do reset remotely, saves us a lot. Uh, if there's things we can do to monitor and validate and certify remotely, can save us a, a, a quite a bit. Um, so we'll be looking to sort of stretch our own internal governance as well. Uh, many of the rules that define how we do it are written by us. So there's, there's a huge opportunity in there uh, for us to, to be more innovative as well. But it's gonna be tough, I'll admit, but um, I'm sure that we'll be supported when we come in and need uh, to expand the workforce a little bit in those locations. Thank you, Jim. Uh, over to Christy with a couple of questions. The first one is, how, how much do these, how much uh, are you helping to finance the cost of these AWASs? And then secondly, can you just spend a minute or so talking about how, how uh, you and the uh, state cooperate in, in determining how the AIP funds are used? I sure will. Uh, so it's, it's a wonderful part of the airport improvement program provided by the uh, uh, recent legislation. We are able to offer these AWAS units to the state of Alaska in this case, since they are the airport sponsor, the airport owner operator at 100% federal funding. That is essential. All of us here in Alaska know how precarious the condition of this state is fiscally. Uh, with oil revenues decreasing, tourism revenues decreased significantly. So it, we put ourselves in the shoes of Alaska Department of Transportation and at, look at, take one look at our office, able to offer these at 100% grant. That has great synergy and that is essential. I'll answer the question, Carrie. It's a high dollar amount. 
Uh, we, are, we are committed to tens of millions of dollars. It is a high dollar. These are high dollar, high profile projects that are essential to preserving access. One of the greatest things that our partnership internally with TechOps and with others has, has provided is uh, Alaska is the pilot program for this provision of reauthorization that requires uh, FAA to take over the AWOS units for ongoing maintenance. I give Jim's office a lot of credit. Uh, Jim had to make a decision. How is he going to prioritize Alaska? And he prioritized it number one for many good reasons, one of which was the tremendous work done by Alaska Air Carriers Association, Matt Atkinson, Jane Dale, who really got into a, a mode of communicating the needs to the congressional delegation. So properly prioritized Alaska is the, the pilot uh, program for the installation of these new AWOS units. Uh, partnership with Alaska DOT is essential and with our non-state sponsors. There will come a time when we are installing additional AWOS units on airports that for whom Alaska DOT is not the sponsor. We do have a number of those airports here in Alaska. We call them our local, our non-state sponsors. Those partnerships are strong also, as we would expect, and, and those will be prioritized. So, so we're real pleased about that. Uh, you know, Matt also brought up another point. Uh, he talked about how one of the priorities is to preserve the Alaskan region and, and preserve its health and its strength. We are very fortunate that Airports Division has our Alaskan region office. We are here in Alaska. Our prowess is statewide and it makes a difference and we're so pleased to be able to commit along those lines. I've got to send this back because we're over time, but I want to ask you one question, hopefully with a five second answer. Do you have a rough approximation in terms of percentage as to how much more it costs to build an air, airport structure up here than it does in the lower 48? I don't have a percentage, but I'll tell you it's a lot of money. It's more than double. Talk to any of my peers, talk to any of our consultants, uh, engineers, construction companies. We're putting out uh, more money than we ever have this year, $400 million our office has put out into the state of Alaska this year. AIP, Supplemental CARES Act. And it wow. takes that much money to help with this infrastructure. Wow, thank you. And thank you panel, uh, for all panelists, thank you very much. You, please enable your video feeds, but mute your audio feeds. And over to Jeannie, and thanks for giving us the time, Jeannie. Thanks, everybody. Sure. Thank you, Carrie. That that was incredible. It's a lot of lot of information there packed in a in a very short time period. So thank you. Um, we do have some uh, some questions. Um, if you guys don't mind hanging around a little bit longer, um, one question, and and I think we've we've answered this partially, or some of you have, um, but this one's pretty direct. It's um, aside from not being required to do so. Why do you think so few Alaskan pilots choose to equip with ADSB? And I'll I'll give that question first to to Lee Ryan, but of course um, Adam or Dan, if, if you want to weigh in as well. Lee. Maybe Lee doesn't like that question. How about uh, how about um, Adam? Yeah, I'll be glad to to fill in a little bit more detail about that. Okay, uh, thank. Some of it uh, has to do with uh, the concept of maybe Big Brother looking over your shoulder. Um, the surveillance concept uh, is not a very warm, fuzzy feeling for a lot of folks here in Alaska. Uh, and, and where we've had a lot of success is when we start showing people the benefits that come with the N component. And that's one of the big concerns I've got about satellite-based ADSB. While it may help with the surveillance side, it doesn't necessarily help with getting FISB data into the cockpit. And so I think part of it too is the, the, the lack of ground stations that we have in the state to where they don't see the benefit of the data coming back into the cockpit, especially the VFR operators where the surveillance is not really a component that they need to be able to operate the benefits that they need to have is the, the end components and trying to educate, it still amazes me the number of questions that I get almost on a daily basis, but where people have a, either a misconception of ADSB 
or just flat out false information uh, that, that we have to do a re-education campaign on to, to be able to say, no, this, this is what is actually going on with ADSB. This is what you need to have. This is what happens when you be, become a participant at ADSB out, the benefits that, that then come from that. So I think some of it still is an education issue that we've got to face. Uh, I think some of it is a, is a perception of big brother uh, that, that we're still fighting here in Alaska. Uh, I have a, a, a have it on good authority that Lee has rejoined us. Lee, are you back? I have rejoined. I had a, a bit of a technical glitch there. No worries. <laughs> for a second, yes, it depends on how you define surveillance, and and uh, you know the the it's in the eye of the beholder, really, when it comes down to it. Surveillance is it is it the FAA? And yeah, there is an age old perception. Um, you know the bush bush pilot perception that the FAA is constantly. Uh, out to get you, and that that um, culture has changed over the years. But but that but it hasn't. We haven't gone past that. I'm not a bush pilot. I've never been in the bush pilot realm. My dad's uh, boy, Wilford Ryan, has gone through that aspect of it as a professional pilot, in transition from the bush days to disciplined professional piloting in Alaska with 34,000 hours and all the experience in the world. Um, I've had GPS. I've had ADSB capstone from the get go. Um, you know, and whether you're talking space-based or GBTs, you know, 9, uh, 1090 or 978, the fact of the matter is in the cockpit, it doesn't matter what's happening when you can't see an aircraft coming at you and you run into each other. Game over, right? So, so that's where it begins and ends with me. And Bethel, for example, you know, it would cost 30 plus million dollars to put radar in. And that's a legacy thing. That's going backwards. It would cost less than a million dollars to equip every aircraft that flies in out of Bethel with 1090, 978, um, doing a re-equipage of, of um, a capstone phase X program, whatever, whatever it's called. Um, and in the end of the day, the surveillance is not so, so much the issue. It's the issue is in the cockpit, how do you keep yourself safe, your customers safe, your aircraft safe, and the general population safe? Got it. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? No? Okay. Uh, I've got another question here. Um, new innovations in technology, such as enhanced vision tools, can save lives in Alaska. What new technology do you think will have the most impact on safety in Alaska? Uh, and that's for anybody who wants to take that. Don't everybody jump in at once. How about you, Mr. Lenny? Any thoughts on that? Uh, it may be the least educated opinion on the panel, uh, <laughs> Jeannie, but I'm happy to provide it as most know about me. Um, I, I've heard it said on this panel, you know, the, the knowledge about weather uh, along the route of flight and at destination. Um, and however that comes, it's, uh, it, you know, I worked the ADSB program in the early days. Uh, surveillance is great. Surveillance is great for the air traffic control. The services coming to the cockpit are great. The technology advancements you get in the cockpit from having a moving map with terrain that you only bought because it also gave you ADSB is also great. But I'd say recently that the, what I've heard and I've observed and I've heard from our folks up there is uh, good weather along the route of flight and at the destination uh, will really um, make a, an enormous impact difference. So that's what I've heard. If I could uh, expand on that a little bit. Please. Um, I'm sorry, Christy, didn't mean to interrupt. Um, to expand on what Jim just said, uh, Tom George has a, a wonderful graphic that he's used a number of times that shows the density of METAR reports in Alaska compared to the density of METAR reports in the Midwestern US. Um, I actually did a little research on my own as far as uh, that the numbers associated with that uh, in some states like Minnesota, there are essentially six times more METARs per volume of area as there are in Alaska. The infrastructure out here is never going to catch up to what folks in the Midwest have because there's nowhere to put it, nowhere to, no way to support it if you did put it somewhere, um, you know, flying maintenance crews in and out all the time, 
cost is prohibitive, every other factor associated with it. So, you know, PIREPs, uh, just for one instance, uh, we look at those in the flight service world as being mobile weather observers, if you will. Um, we need to pump up the training of pilots to give PIREPs routinely, you know, at least one per flight, and especially if they're going through a mountain pass, maybe two or three or four, so that pilots do get the information they need. Uh, additionally, I know there are lots of efforts underway to uh, support digital reporting of PIREPs from the cockpit, uh, looking for ways which are unobtrusive to the pilot. Uh, for instance, ADSB sending in automatic pilot reports uh, when you know there's large amounts of vertical or horizontal acceleration on the on the machinery. There there are any number of things. Uh, that's what I was talking about earlier about closing the donut holes. Uh, there are so many places where we don't have the infrastructure, and so we can't pass on information that we can't get. Okay, Christy, did you have? Did you want to weigh in on that? I was just going to uh, point everyone to our NTSB recommendations that have come off of accidents. And we've all talked about it here extensively. A lot of it is weather-based. Many of us know either directly or <clears throat> in our, our circle of, of friends and acquaintances of individuals who have lost their lives in controlled flight into terrain accidents here in Alaska. And uh, th this AWOS fortifying the number of units, having FAA take them over, relieving the financial burden on the airport owners and operators, it makes a difference. Okay, thank if you. I, Anybody else wanna weigh in? Yeah, if I could just add something to that uh, conversation. I think more to directly answer the question that was asked though about innovations and new technology and all those things. I think we need to be careful that while enhanced vision, um, you know, infrared technology that, that is being installed in a lot of aircraft to be able to see through the dark, um, I, we need to be careful um, because I, I remember when moving map and terrain data was first starting to come into the cockpit and people that emboldened people to do things that they probably shouldn't have been doing to begin with. And so we need to balance innovation and new technologies that we don't outpace the capabilities of the machines that we're operating and that we don't outpace the capabilities and the proficiency of the pilots who are operating those machines. So while there's a lot of really exciting technologies on the horizon. Uh, none of it replaces, like Andy was saying, none of it replaces real world information that we see. And again, the weather camera program to, to go back to Walter, um, those cameras were probably one of the biggest innovations to help increase safety because we actually saw a picture of what was going on and we decided, you know what, I'm not gonna go out and fly on that. I'm not gonna go stick my nose in it. Even if I had enhanced vision, with infrared technology or something else, I shouldn't be there. And so having that ability to make that decision on the ground before we go keeps us from finding ourselves in an environment where we wish we had stayed on the ground. Thank you for that, Adam. Uh, yes, well done. Um, thank you very much. I think we are almost out of time. Um, and so uh, again, let's give, give everybody a round of applause. This has been a really great safety summit, great information. Um, great interaction and good to see everybody as well. Um, so I, I'd like to ask uh, the administrator to rejoin us um, to share some, some closing remarks. Administrator? Well, thanks, Jeannie. And uh, really uh, great uh, discussion today. I've got my cheaters on because I've been taking notes throughout. Uh, so, and I really, I, I think Adam's comment uh, at the end there was, really important. Um, and, and, you know, we need to have a balance, you know, we need to realize that, uh, you know, we shouldn't be we, we shouldn't use uh, technology and, and new, new capabilities to take undue risk. Um, however, uh, I, I think we all understand that, you know, aviation is part of the lifeblood. I mean, in the US, but it's because we're such a mobile society. But in Alaska, it's absolutely essential to survival. I really like the comment earlier about, you know, people not going to the grocery store in a small 
village or community um, going up to the airport, you know, and that, that really kind of makes it hit home. So it's not that we, uh, that we want to take undue risks, uh, but we want to make sure that we really are, um, you know, encouraging operations and actually operating uh, in accordance with, you know, what the, what, what, uh, what, what the, what the system can really uh, accommodate. And um, so we'll continue to work on that. Um, you know, I heard a lot, obviously, today about infrastructure. And I think it's important to understand that, you know, again, and I mentioned this a little bit at the beginning, the agency has uh, really two capital budgets. Um, you know, I'm used to having uh, an operating budget, you know, when I was at the airline for, you know, op daily operations and then a capital budget for, you know, uh, brick and mortar and, uh, you know, flight simulators and airplanes and, and things like that, you know, the gates, um, you know, uh, other types of physical infrastructure. But at the FAA, we have two capital budgets. We have AIP for airports, and that gets a lot of support in Congress because, uh, you know, it basically is helping our, our airport infrastructure, which again is what a lot of the public sees. But a lot of these things that we're talking about here, and I realize some of it may be able to be funded through AIP, but it really requires what we in the agency call um, F and E dollars. And we've got a huge backlog in the agency of billions of dollars because um, you know, our sustainment budget hasn't, hasn't kept up consistently with what has been politically uh, you know, more, more attractive sometimes in terms of investment in, uh, in, in the airport uh, infrastructure, frankly. And uh, because again, that's stuff that, that people can, can see. Uh, but, you know, ADSB ground stations, um, you know, radars, wh whatever you want to choose, towers, you know, those, those things, if they're federal property, you know, they have to be funded through, through F&E and, &E and, uh, and sustained through that budget. So that's something that, uh, you know, that we'll certainly take in. I've been a big advocate of making sure that we clear uh, some of that backlog out. Um, and we'll hope to have that funded adequately in future budgets, but it's something that, that we all need to keep a focus on. Um, a, uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of good um, uh, comments about, obviously, uh, you know, we've talked about climate change and, you know, impact on physical infrastructure, uh, erosion, uh, airport pavements, um, the, uh, the comments earlier about, you know, collaboration and communication on the air tour meetings and, uh, you know, charge supplements. And I think that I see a connection between digital information and, you know, keeping things, uh, keeping things current uh, for our aviators out there. Um, ADSB heard a lot about that. And uh, I, I was hopeful that, you know, space-based ADSB would help us uh, with some of the gaps. But really, when we're talking about uh, smaller, you know, airplanes and, and general aviation operations, doesn't really help us out a whole lot because uh, the current provider, and there may be some competition in that space in the coming years, the current provider can can only see 1090, and um, and also you need a top mounted antenna. So you know, there's going to be even for those who would choose to equip and choose to turn the switch on, um, you know, then. Uh, you know, you're, you're going to have limited coverage there. So, you know, that's something that we need to take a look at. Um, safety management systems for part 135. Uh, we have, we are, have already initiated rulemaking on that. We realize it needs to be scalable and um, you know uh, it's not just 135, it's other types of, of, uh, of, of companies uh, in the industry, but we want to take uh, SMS uh, past the uh, part 121 carriers, because it's been a, a great success. We think we can scale that capability, um, you know, in, into other parts of the, of the system. So um, uh, great dialogue today. I think we've got a, a lot we can continue to work on together. Um, you know, we've all heard a great deal today about um, Alaska safety, security and capacity challenges. 
as well as what we in the government um, and those in the industry can do to help. Um, and so with some of those highlights and focusing on the futures, I want to again highlight the NTSB safety recommendation from earlier this year, asking us to work with um, the uh, aviation stakeholders in Alaska to form a safety focus working group to review, prioritize, and integrate Alaska's aviation safety needs into the FAA safety enhancement process. So, you know, uh, you know, you're asking for a unified approach. I'm all about breaking down uh, silos, breaking down stovepipes within the agency. There's multiple things that we're doing um, to, to achieve that. But uh, I've asked Carrie to lead a cross-agency group of FAA experts to focus on the safety issues um, in, that are particular to Alaska. Um, we've heard a lot about some of the good things that we've done. We've done a lot of great things. We need to understand what those are, how we're deploying our resources, how effective those actions have been, and, and what else we can do to uh, continue to work together to improve. So in the near term, you know, we're, we're putting together an inventory of recent, ongoing, and planned FAA efforts in Alaska. And then we'll synthesize all those efforts together to make sure we all know what each other are doing uh, so that we can move forward. And this is, you know, obviously a lot within the agency, but also uh, other stakeholders as well, including uh, our colleagues in the, uh, in, uh, up in the uh, Alaska State Government, Department of Transportation, and, um, you know, all the associations and the operators as well. Um, and from there, we'll fully engage with the community uh, to see what's, what's realistic, what we want to go after, and where we can prioritize efforts to have uh, a substantial and, and long lasting positive effect on aviation safety in the quickest manner possible. And I think over the long term, um, you know, this, this group will allow industry to have a go to connection when they want to bring issues to our attention. But it works both ways. You know, you've got to make your voices heard um, in the industry. Um, I've been a loud voice myself. And uh, so, you know, we'll need to, we'll, we'll definitely need uh, input, but it can't be just one stakeholder. You know, we can't, it can't just be the loudest voice. It's got to be the entire uh, community working together. Uh, otherwise, you know, we'll tend to get whipsawed. So we, we need to really understand where the biggest value is. So we'll, we'll be asking the industry for input, um, um, especially obviously uh, within the state. So my my charge to everyone is, you know, let's make this event today um, a beginning, not a middle or an end. And, um, you know, our collaboration uh, to make aviation safety in Alaska and the aviation operations in Alaska the best it can possibly be um, and the best our stakeholders deserve, that's a, that's a real commitment. And um, our virtual door for now is always open. Uh, when the topic is is uh, safety and and by closely related to that, obviously is security, capacity, and infrastructure. And I think the same goes. Well, I know the same goes for uh, all the uh, leaders within the FAs of various lines of business. So, again, thanks everyone for your participation uh, today. It's been a long time. You know, everybody's probably getting Zoom fatigue. We do about five thousand Zoom meetings a day at the agency right now and about a thousand Microsoft Teams meetings and then various webinars and other types of platforms. Um, I think my personal record is 13 in a single day. I think today I had 11. So, um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna continue to have the, keep the dialogue going and uh, just really appreciate everyone's leadership, uh, their passion and, uh, and commitment to work together. So uh, with that, you know, hopefully I'll see everybody in person um, sooner rather than later. So thank you everyone for being here today. And Jeannie, back to you. Well, that concludes our safety summit. Um, thanks to everybody. We're recording this session and it will be available later on FAA's uh, platform. So we'll make sure that you guys have a link to that. And uh, thank you very much. It was good to see everybody. Thank you. Thank you.